everybody. We are officially live on Access Humboldt now. Oh, okay. Well, should we give Leslie a little bit more time or do you want to get started? Um, I think we can give her a minute or two. Okay. okay. Yeah, she's, she's usually pretty prompt. Uh-huh. Well, I got me so far. Yeah. Perfect. Pretty much all right. Good. All right. Thanks, Tony. Uh -huh. Hey. And Tony's here. Is Eric here? We don't have Eric yet. And Leslie is connecting now. Okay, oh. good, good. There she is. Okay. Hey. So we have our board. So I will call the November 12th, 2020 meeting of Humboldt Waste Management Board of Directors to, uh, to order and ask for roll call, please. Bone? Yep. Castellano? Here. Hogan? Yeah, here. Herrera? Here. Wilson? Here. Sweeney? Present. Thank you. So next item on our agenda is the consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered to be routine by the HWMA board. It will be acted upon by one motion unless a specific request. A review is made by a board member or a member of the public. Consent calendar will not be read. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless polled for discussion. Is there any member of the board that would like to pull an item from the consent calendar? Um, I just have a question about the uh, green waste about uh, item C. Uh, would you just like to ask a quick question or is it more of an involved? Yeah, discussion? I just. Um, uh, no, I just was curious. Um, it's a pretty unique agreement, and Arcata is the only um, member of the JPA that has this type of agreement. So I was just curious um, to know a little bit more about that, and if there are other um, cities in the JPA that um, have attempted to do something similar, or kind of how it came about, um, and why. Why just Arcata? Sure. Um, if it's okay with the chair, I can go ahead and answer the question from a big picture per uh, perspective. Sure, go ahead. So the short story is that we have an agreement with um, uh, Mad River Hardwoods for the processing of uh, HWMA's uh, green waste material, and that includes all of our member agencies. We also had a um, direct um, agreement with the city of Arcata because the city of Arcata had established a, a no fee drop off for Arcata residents. And so um, Arc what, what happens is Arcata residents drop off the material, the material is logged in, Madriver Hardwoods then bills us because it's member agency material. We then turn around and bill the city of Arcata for that material and that's, that's what that relationship is. Underneath the master agreement if you will, that we have with Matter for Hardwoods. Any city can go ahead and, and uh, avail to this. It was one of the provisions that we made. City of our, excuse me, City of Eureka um, simply has a, um, 
a franchise agreement where Green Waste is picked up at the curb and brought to HWMA's facility, as well as kind of self-hauling, and um, residents pay for um, the material that's coming across um, the scale. So Eureka residents are taken care of. The city of Blue Lake has been a little bit different in the sense that you guys have um, opted to have a more direct relationship with your hauler, where you've had the free, the two free Green Waste uh, drop-offs per year, and I don't honestly understand uh, how the financing of that particular agreement is handled other than uh, that is between the city and the hauler. Uh, but the city of Blue Lake is receiving HWMA's member agency rates for the processing of green waste materials. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, does any member of the public wish to pull an item from the consent calendar? Hearing none, seeing none, let's move on to um, approve the consent calendar. Is there a motion to approve? I will make a motion to approve the consent calendar. We have a motion. Is there a second? Yeah, and I'll we second. Have a second. Okay. Elaine seconded that. So using the roll call order, Tyler, can we vote on the consent calendar, please? Bone? Yep. Good. Yes, Lana? Aye. Hogan? Yes. Herrera? Aye. Wilson? Yes. Sweet. Aye. Motion carries. <clears throat> Next item on our agenda is oral and written communications. This is a time to provide for people who address the board or to submit written communications concerning matters not on this agenda. Are there any um, does anyone from the public wish to speak to an issue not on this evening's agenda? Or I'll ask staff if they've received any written um, communications. Uh, yeah, I'll just note that in your board packet, there is a, an announcement under agenda item three uh, for, um, uh, well, from uh, Zero Waste Humboldt. They were announcing that Sunday, November 15th, they're going to have the Zero Heroes Night. Um, I don't have a lot of information about it other than what is in your uh, packet itself. Um, so I would encourage folks to contact Zero Waste Humboldt uh, at gmail.com. We were originally uh, going to have a presentation from Zero Waste Humboldt uh, this evening. It was, uh, it needed to be continued due to a personal reason. Uh, so we'll have the board uh, hear that in January, but they were able to provide me this information to make sure that board members and interested members of the public could participate uh, in their evening on, on the 15th at 7 p.m. Great. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Jill. Uh, next item on our agenda is to receive and approve the 2021 2025 capital improvement plan. Back to Jill. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually going to be introducing Tyler and have him present this information as uh, okay. board members know. Um, we have our, the, the first uh, capital improvement plan uh, was presented to you all in uh, late 2016. And so Tyler uh, and our other directors have been working hard at uh, revising and, and uh, making it a little bit more modern. So I'm gonna turn it over to Tyler. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, thank you, uh, members of the board. Uh, just going to hit some greatest hits here, and then I'll turn it over for questions if you have any. Um, being closed to CIP is a five-year window now instead of a seven-year window. Um, five years is a little more standard, um, and the uh, anticipated plan is to bring the, the plan before the board at each annual budget. Um, we'll bring it in at the draft uh, meeting to discuss upcoming projects and any adjustments that the board may want to see or that staff is recommending. Um, and a lot of this is all based, of course, on available funding, um, other projects going on, um, and what might lead to having to delay or move projects around. Uh, in the past, uh, the CIP, uh, as Jill mentioned, was presented in uh, 2016. Uh, and has gone fairly untouched since then. We have made minor adjustments to the projects as presented, but in general, all the projects have been completed um, in one way or another. Um, and so what you're seeing here is the start of a new CIP for a new five-year window. 
um, you'll notice that there are 14 projects total and almost half of them are dated for fiscal year 2021, which is the year, of course, we are currently in. Um, that is the tail end of the old uh, CIP, which has now basically reached the end of its life with the exception of one project, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, so a lot of those projects are gonna fall off this year and you'll see a lot of new projects either begin or the planning for them be uh, introduced in fiscal year 2026 um, to show sort of the growth and continuance of this capital improvement plan. Um, to kind of go over uh, some of the small things about the plan, obviously it is not approval of any of the projects that are listed in it. It is merely a guide that staff will use to implement uh, board direction. <clears throat> and of course, uh, we will bring all of these projects before the board for final approval of the bid documents, the final approval of, of any other sort of plan that's required before we even start looking for someone to uh, implement these projects. Uh, they all, all projects in the CIP are above the threshold for which any director, um, including the executive director, have spending authority. Um, so only the board can approve the implementation of projects and the final result of those projects. Uh, let's see. Um, uh, next, uh, finally, honestly, there's uh, only one uh, item on this plan that we're actually recommending the board remove tonight, and that is the materials recovery facility. Uh, this is the final project from the 2013 strategic plan going even further back that was implemented by the board in that year uh, with the aim at improving diversion and implementing a, a number of programs and projects in the authority uh, with the intent of reducing total tonnage to landfill and sort of implementing a better vision of the authority's operations uh, over a 10 year period. The materials recovery facility is the last project on that list that has not been addressed by authority staff and the board. And looking at it, it is also the one that was at the highest risk for being adjusted as the authority grew over the last, uh, actually, of course, now eight years. Um, things have changed enough that there are reasons why the, the MRF uh, would not actually be as useful for the authority as it once was imagined in 2013. Uh, first off, there are uh, considerations for space um, and other uh, issues in the facility itself. Uh, there's of course cost, although that cost would be borne over a number of years as we have borne other large projects. Um, but more importantly, as things have changed, um, especially in our uh, partnership with Recology, a materials recovery facility would kind of step on private business uh, activities currently. And that's something that the authority has always sort of shied away from um, unless absolutely necessary. So when you look at the, the overall view of the authority currently, adding this anticipated materials recovery facility simply doesn't work with the current view of the authority and its ongoing narrative. Uh, so as part of the approval of the draft CIP, which you see before you, we are asking the board to approve removal of the materials recovery facility and that final copy will actually have that component removed. Uh, that takes the total amount of projects from approximately 12 and a half million to one and a half million. Um, it's a, of course a sizable step down, uh, but these projects that will be left are better uh, designed to first address ongoing maintenance and upgrade issues for authority equipment, and secondly, prepare us for new projects, um, uh, such as anything that might come up with organics, um, other recycling uh, items that we may find. And of course, we're still working on our facility master planning. And when we get back to that, we'll be looking at some significant costs there as well. Uh, that is this CIP in a nutshell. Um, if you have any questions, I am available. Okay, thank you, Tyler. Do board members have any questions? Maybe we can go down the roll call vote, Tyler, to give people uh, opportunities to ask questions. Yes, uh, Boom. Yeah, I noticed the excavator in the wheel. Didn't we replace a couple of those already? 
Uh, we have. So uh, there are two different versions of the projects on the CIP. Um, the, mo the ones that are most recent are for the landfill. Uh, the landfill's equipment hasn't been touched basically since we uh, took over the landfill. So they have a mini excavator and a mini backhoe, which are doing uh, minor repair work around the landfill. And that, those equi that equipment is just aging. Um, what we're trying to get the directors into is a life cycle of making sure that equipment is at the very least current enough to be easily repaired. Um, at the transfer station, everything that's on there, the, the most current loader is the last one to be upgraded. We actually haven't touched it um, again since about 2005, 2006. Um, and anything else you see on there, for instance, the other excavator is actually not even planned to be looked at until 2025. It's on there as an example of what the board will see, for instance, coming up in the next fiscal year budget when we review and move this uh, capital improvement plan forward a year. We won't even be talking about its replacement and purchase for another four years. All right. Okay. Uh, the only, hang on a second. The only other, the only other thing I said, I know we just voted on two pickups and I did want to ask a question. I see one's 50 and one's 30. And I noticed we're asking for heavy duty and one of them was a pretty old half ton that Dodge. And then I noticed we're asking now for diesels and how many miles are those driven annually to, for that kind of an upgrade for what we're talking about and how often do they haul a 12,000 pound trailer? Uh, so they don't often haul that much material, um, but it, uh, they are used regularly for the hauling of material is I guess the best way to put it. They won't yeah. be, uh, the, the one at the transfer station will actually be replacing two vehicles. Uh, we have an F550 flatbed down there and we will actually be replacing it as well to do the heavy duty lifting of both vehicles. Um, at the landfill, it is the only uh, piece of equipment available for staff. So it will be moving um, most likely uh, a water buffalo uh, for regular watering throughout the facility, as well as any material hauling for staff back to the landfill themselves. Uh, it seems like a lot of pickup, but okay. Uh, Rex, to dovetail on what Tyler said, one of the biggest issues we've had in the past with replacing equipment is that we pigeonhole ourselves into the current operations that we're currently doing. And a lot of times that requires us to replace equipment that maybe doesn't need to be too soon. What, uh, at least for the transfer station, what I'm doing is there's no plans to replace the 550, like Tyler mentioned. Um, we already need the 1500 replaced. Instead of getting another 1500, um, we're going to use the 2500 to replace both these vehicles in hopes that if there are future activities such as uh, tire events, um, possible hazardous waste events, uh, white good events, that this pickup will be able to do double duty um, in better. that capacity. Correct. Okay. Thank you, Eric. Any other questions, Rex? No, I just, the diesel is about an $8,500 add on. I just didn't know. For unless it was using an extreme amount of miles and everything else, I didn't know if it was worth the add-on. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, Castellano. Um, just a quick question about the materials uh, recovery facility. Um, it seems like as we continue to uh, do the waste analysis, we may identify you know, need for other improvements or, or maybe different types of materials that would need to be recovered. And then I'm assuming that we could address that in future plans in terms of perhaps we don't need, you know, a, a CRV materials recovery facility, but we need something else and we could then make plans at that point. Is that kind of the idea that, that we're looking at here? Yeah, um, in part, in part, um, you know, when uh, Tyler was referring to the material recovery facility that is being operated by Recology, that is a recycling, uh, you know, facility. What we would be looking at is what they refer to as a dirty MRF. So basically, the garbage coming in would then be sorted, and then identify if there's any uh, materials with, uh, that is in there that could be recovered, whether it's wood or it's paper. Or, of course, you know, it's already been uh, intermixed with garbage, so it makes it a little bit harder. 
at the time that this was undertaken um, in 2011, when the uh, strategic plan initially kicked off, the recycling market was still pretty strong. And of course, today we're having more and more difficulty even finding uh, markets for materials that are coming off that back end in that manner. Uh, we'd probably be better served to figure out how to establish diversion programs that uh, in, uh, sort of retain the integrity of that material so that it's not being intermixed with garbage and then separated out, but you know, trying to find ways that uh, we're keeping it intact so we can actually get it into some sort of uh, recycling or other uh, processing uh, type. Um, uh, there's a word I'm looking for and it's just kind of missing, but you know, that's, that's kind of, I think the dirty MRFs were, we're all right, but I think the world is changing uh, quickly enough that we recognize that we need to have a higher quality material if we're going to get it back into a market for, uh, for recycling or reuse. Mm. Yeah. There are also just other materials which our focus may be better uh, utilized for. Um, and I think that'll take, again, the end of that characterization study to fully understand. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Leslie. Okay. Next. Uh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. Next person, Tyler. I don't have any questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, to, to Leslie's point, I think, um, you know, I, I, I can understand, you know, pulling the MRF. I, I think that makes makes a lot of sense, kind of given where we are versus, you know, several years ago, but recognizing that, yeah, as we get more information, we may need to amend the CIP and, and add something else into it. So um, I, I think it's good that we're doing a five-year CIP, um, shortening it and recognizing, right, that if we need to revise it, we can. So, um, so yeah, thank you. And by the way, just really appreciate the formatting of this really easy to read through. So, yeah, definitely. You know, That's the hope. That's the hope. Um, as a guide document, it's not meant to be terribly technical. And I, I think, again, to, to drive this point home, um, rather than kind of letting it live on its own for a while, we'll bring it back as a uh, primary component of the budget so that it's being looked at every year. Even if we don't add anything in a year, it's something that the board is considering. And of course, as we get more information and have better uses for bigger projects, they will absolutely enter into the CIP. Okay, thank you, Sophia. Uh, Wilson. Well, just the only thing I have is on the, the little project office out at the landfill. Mm -hmm. is, is that another, um, I haven't been out there, but is that a, uh, you have like some kind of a trailer house or portable uh, modular building there now? Yeah, we do. It's a very old trailer. It's been out there for quite, quite some time. Um, and it has uh, weathered, not only weather, but just a, a variety of uses throughout the life of the landfill. Uh, we are looking at a number, a couple of different ways to implement a new office going forward. Um, one of which might be just improvements to our shop area, which allow for staff to have an internal office on the same footprint um, with less effort than replacing the trailer outside. Um, the shop area is extremely well protected and improvements to it would simply make more sense. They would take a lot less uh, time and effort as well. Um, so it's just something that's been actually in the process for uh, about four years now. We've tried to revisit it over and over again, and uh, we're getting a lot closer now, thank God. Um, so uh, it, it's a good project, and it's just something that our staff has put up with a, a very outdated and aging uh, break and office area for quite some time. So it's just due for an upgrade. So I'm going to add that um, this is actually an item that has been approved um, a couple of times. We had initially anticipated that the trailer replacement would be about, you know, $25,000, $30,000. And at the point that we uh, started looking into a replacement of that project, we, it will have to meet ADA. It has to have seismic um, fittings and whatnot. And um, there were a couple of other you know, items very quickly ramped up the cost. And when we got the most recent um, set of estimates early last year, it was over 120 some odd thousand dollars. 
with all the improvements that we're going to have to be made to the site and everything else, I said, we ought to be talking about brick and mortar because uh, you know a trailer is only going to have a limited time frame. So we started looking at the, the alternate of maybe getting it moved inside the existing maintenance building and what would it take to make that happen. So um, the simple replacement of the trailer turns out that it's, uh, you know, the trailer I think was, was probably purchased about 1975. Has, you know it's, it's got some issues and um, so we are we are looking at um, you know bringing it more modern and bringing it into the building itself so it's a it's a proper office space itself so then it really hasn't been determined what what you're actually going to do you're still you're still kind of a work in progress to to, to approve. Yeah, okay. that's correct we we were making pretty good headway until um, you know everything sort of came to a suspension, if you will. I don't think that we're at a halt. We're just sort of in this weird suspensions place. So uh, yeah, we've been looking at um, some preliminary engineering designs and um, getting some new quotes and, and moving that forward. Okay, so I, that's why it, well, it didn't really spell it out in the description is why I was asking. I understand that whatever you had needed to go, but um, mm -hmm. I think that answers my question and that's, the, the rest of it all looks like it's wear and tear on machinery that you're going to have to replace to keep your place going. So I'm good. And thank you, Frank. And Sweeney. Well, let's see. Um, yeah, I appreciate the fact that we can revisit this each year during our budget discussions that allows for any amendments that are necessary at that time, as well as just kind of a refresher for board members as to what these projects are and what constitutes our CIP program. And I would also like to echo other directors and I really appreciated that the format that you presented the, the, the projects and it was just kind of boom, 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 boom. And, and you know, you get, you get the gist and, and move forward. So good job there. Um, so let's see, are there any comments from the public on this um, capital improvement plan? I'm not even sure we have any public, do we? Oh, we got lots of people lots here today. <laughs> Okay, I don't see anybody raising their hands or jumping up and down. So is there a motion you want to, to do all four of these in one motion? Yeah. Yes. So we're looking at um, a motion that um, directs staff to remove materials recovery facility from the list of planned projects, except the 2021, 2025, CIP and take other directions as appropriate. Is there I'll a motion? motion to accept the 2021 2025 capital improvement plan with um, the amendment of removing the materials recovery facility project from the list of planned projects? Thank you. We have a motion. Is there I'll a second? second? And we have I a second. Have Okay, Tyler, can we go down the roll call, please? Of course. Bone? Yep. Castellano? Aye. Hogan? Yes. Herrera? Aye. Wilson? Yes. Sweeney? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, moving along. Um, see, I've lost my agenda. Where did it go? <laughs> No, that's the old one. Okay, well, it got lost in the pile somewhere. What what is the uh, the next item? Is is the PRV pilot study? It is. Oh, um, this is going to be made into a movie. Just. For those that of you that are interested in it, it'll be on Netflix by this time next year. 
Yeah. So I'll turn it over to Jill to give you a little preview. Yeah, um, I'm going to be sharing my screen with you. So um, she'll just bear with me for one moment. Um, let me just make sure that I got it here. Can you guys all see this thus far? Excellent, excellent. So um, again, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity for um, us all to be discussing this, the CRV um, and our conceptual CRV pilot project that had been developed over the last um, month and a half, two months uh, for the public as well as the board. And to provide you the most recent update uh, of our um, project, I am trying to um, find a way to get, there you guys, now you're up at the top of the screen and that helps. So as board members will recall, um, the original intent of the state's CRV um, Container and Litter Act of 1986, oftentimes referred to as the bottle bill, was to incentivize recycling by establishing a fee for beverage containers and beverage manufacturers pay this fee to CalRecycle, uh, whether it's five cents or 10 cents a, a unit, and they pass that fee on to consumers uh, at the point of sale. And these collected CRV payments uh, that are paid in the stores do not go to our local recycling centers. The collected monies are all being used to support uh, the state cow recycle programs. Now, initially, uh, consumers purchasing a beverage uh, would then conveniently redeem the empty container at a store when they next visited. And this is how the uh, program functioned for a lot of years. But as the commodities market uh, values increased, there was uh, an also a, a corresponding increase of independent recycling redemption centers. And those obligated retailers uh, welcomed these redemption centers because they relieved the store of the responsibility to redeem, to staff to handle the materials, bail, and ship the used containers to market, wherever that may be. And that the, uh, the primary beverage um, type, the material type in the mid 1980s was of course, aluminum and glass. And with the exception of Perrier or some other similar glass bottled water, people didn't purchase bottled water off the shelf. And certainly we didn't have uh, water in plastic uh, 16 ounce bottles. Uh, and today there's a greater proliferation of an array of beverage types that are now available to consumers. And increasingly those beverages are being sold in plastic containers, which of course are a lower value commodity. Now, Locally, uh, CalRecycle, there's 23 convenience zones and CalRecycle has exempted 78% of those convenience zone obligated retailers from having to provide CRV buyback services or having to pay the $100 a fine for not providing that CRV redemption service. Um, as uh, board members well know, um, in 2010, there were a little more than 10 CRV redemption facilities in uh, Humboldt County. And by um, early 2020, that had been reduced to five uh, facilities. And of course, four of our uh, facilities were decertified in September of 2020. Now, CalRecycle uh, in late October, I believe the letter went out on um, October 20th, uh, CalRecycle issued letters to the obligated retailers informing them of their now unserved status. They used to be exempt, now they're unserved and that they must either provide CRV redemption services or pay the $100 a day fine to CalRecycle. So the closure of the CRV redemption services uh, centers, excuse me, statewide, you know, as we've discussed, are the result of an economic collapse, which has resulted from a continued and steep decline of commodity scrap um, values over the last five years, and even more so following uh, China's national sword policy. There are additional factors, uh, which include reduction in the state processing uh, payments that uh, are received by recyclers, as well as a rise in our operational costs that have resulted from state requirements, such as minimum wage increases. And with the closing of over 298 CRV redemption centers in early 2016, that was then followed by a second wave of closures in 2019 
2019 by, the Cal by California's largest chain of almost 300 recycling centers that were owned by Replanet, the state legislature approved uh, two related bills that established a CRB pilot project program, which requires that local jurisdictions and recycling center operators work closely together in order to provide more redemption uh, opportunities for consumers. Jurisdictions are required to meet certain eligibility requirements and then they apply for the pilot project. And each jurisdiction itself must have an approved pilot project recycler. A combination of jurisdictions can, com uh, can complete and attach uh, supporting information into a singular uh, application. As uh, provided for underneath AB 54, um, Eligible projects are, uh, may receive up to a million dollars in funding to offset uh, those eligible costs that were incurred through July of 2022. After the grant timeline terminates, pilot project funding and the allowances such as uh, appointments or modified operating hours, processing and handling fees will revert to regular Cal Recycle uh, requirements. In short, this is kind of pathway looks like. So you've got your jurisdiction and your recycler and they begin to sort of bandy about different um, ideas for how they can um, improve and expand the opportunity of uh, CRV redemption by um, uh, the consumer. And the jurisdiction will then put together their application and submit it to CalRecycle. CalRecycle will then evaluate that uh, application and they will determine whether or not to approve it. At the point that the application uh, is approved, the jurisdiction is then invited to apply for a grant fund. Uh, at the same time, they can then work with the recycler uh, to uh, prepare their application. And in this case, the recycler can't submit their application unless and until the jurisdiction has been approved and they have explicit uh, permission by the um, uh, jurisdiction to apply for this. Now, um, and I kind of skipped ahead of this, um, uh, at the October 20th uh, Humboldt County Board of Supervisors meeting, I was able to make a presentation to the board about the state of CRV and the pilot project concept. And the board directed county staff to initiate preparation of the pilot project uh, jurisdiction application. The application is only applicable to the unincorporated areas of the county unless other municipal jurisdictions express an interest in either submitting individual applications or be willing to enter into some form of memorandum of agreement with the county uh, so that they can prepare a joint application. Because HWMA is located within the city of Eureka's jurisdiction, we would be dependent upon the city of Eureka agreeing to be a participating jurisdiction uh, for purposes of uh, Leslie, I do want to note that I have uh, provided this information to both uh, Robin and um, uh, Donna last week. Uh, in order to assist the county, I did prepare and submitted a draft memorandum of agreement, which was submitted to their staff and legal counsel to initiate uh, their review, and that was uh, completed last week. And then once complete, the um, agreement would uh, be submitted to interested uh, city jurisdictions. Now. Interested recyclers such as HWMA, because that's what we are in this case, cannot submit the application until the jurisdiction itself has been approved and the jurisdiction has authorized uh, the product recyclers to submit an application. Um, as I uh, note in the staff report, uh, we would have to be uh, recertified uh, and complete the certification training uh, in the jurisdictions where there would be a proposed pilot project and uh, we will need to identify the potential recycling sites prior to submitting uh, the application. And, um, you know, as we've talked about before, the primary incentive is that the participating recyclers um, would be able to uh, deviate from certain requirements that are um, uh, statutorily required. Now, HWMA was being encouraged by CalRecycle to uh, submit a pilot project application. This was applicable only to the Eureka Recycling Center site. 
Now, um, with the uh, other three redemption sites decertified, as we discussed with the board, as we did with the, the Board of Supervisors, the Eureka Recycling Center site simply can't operate as the sole CRV redemption center in Humboldt, simply because of our facility size and our staffing constraints. And of course, even if we were to be operating by appointment only, it's critical to understand that in reviewing the grant criterion, proposals are to be designed to improve redemption sites and to create new convenience sites. And an appointment-based application does not meet the basic qualifying criteria. And we've had uh, several conversations with um, Cal Recycle staff uh, on that matter. Um, as uh, I've uh, previously expressed, you know, for all of the recycling uh, centers for the redemption component, we are required to operate consistent with Cal Recycle regulations or be subject to violations. And we very, we have very, very little uh, operational latitude or flexibility. And as board members are well aware, um, HWMA did make inquiries last spring with Cal Recycle uh, to discuss whether or not we could do the pop-up uh, or secure another operator to uh, perform offsite. CRV services under our certification, or that we could accept uh, customers temporarily on an appointment basis. And the answer, of course, was no. Uh, HWMA, Humboldt Sanitation, and Recology had also previously met with Senator McGuire's staff in early June in order to express our concerns and trying to find some form of workaround. Now, um, to prepare you here, um, these images were taken uh, early in the morning. So you're gonna see a lot of them are, are closed and there's no people or vehicles that are around. But one of the things that I wanted to share with all of you is that, um, uh, as I noted, these were taken you know, first thing in the morning and, and I'm hoping that it kind of helps to convey some of the reasons for our concern. This uh, slide in particular is Humboldt Sanitation's Recycling Center and the former uh, CRV Redemption. Uh, their transfer station is uh, the blue and white building, which is located further behind uh, this little carport where they perform their, their sorting activity for recycling. The overall footprint of their facility is very small and they have very limited parking, as you can see here. Uh, the site is adjacent to the Q lane, which is is, uh, will bring you into the transfer station scales. So when recycling customers are backing out of the parking space, they have to navigate the trash customers that are in the queue or they, uh, as in order so that they can go into the queue to go uh, drop off their garbage or they have to cross that line in order to exit the facility. Uh, this is the transfer station, which is located in Redway, and they have two distinct areas uh, in a singular building. This side of the facility accepts trash, and this side of their facility is accepting uh, recycling and uh, the former CRV uh, transactions. This is uh, Eel River Recology's Fortuna transfer station. This building here accepts all of the solid waste. And um, here we have um, where the recycling center is accepted. And I believe on the back side, uh, last time I was there was when uh, Harry Harden still had it under Eel River. Uh, there was the um, mechanics repair shop that was back there. Um, and of course, uh, HWMA's Eureka Recycling Center. Um, this photo was taken earlier this year and um, the CRV scales, uh, have been moved a little bit. We made some improvements in here, but the scales are adjacent uh, to the gray uh, scale house and the remainder of the facilities behind those uh, drop-off bins is where we perform the appliance receipt and dismantling as well as televisions and uh, uh, computer screens and other electronic waste in addition to storing whatever baled recyclable uh, materials we have. We also have two 50 uh, yard bin containers which is where um, a lot of the uh, plastic and the aluminum uh, was placed into. So, in an effort to address the problem that no singular recycling location is of sufficient size to meet the needs of Humboldt residents, I approached 
uh, Humboldt Sanitation and Recology in mid-October to have them reassess their interest and potential willingness to reconsider and evaluate participating in a pilot project. And specifically what we talked about is um, that we would all be able to uh, be recertified. And um, one of the things that's been really great is, as we've discussed with the board, Calorie Cycle was requiring that uh, voucher training be performed in Sacramento while the rest of the state is in a shelter in place. Uh, Calorie Cycle's uh, training is going to be finally offered online and they're going to be uh, uh, able to put that into place uh, in December, uh, I believe. The other thing we're looking at is developing protocols for operation at recycling centers on an appointment-based model in order to manage the customer volumes. I think you have a better sense. We're the biggest one and we're still, we had, you know, people waiting three, four hours to get into our facility. Imagine what that would have looked like for Redway and uh, McKinleyville in particular. So if we're going to be looking at reopening, uh, having an appointment-based model or some other way in order to manage inbound customers, uh, is going to be crit critical. Uh, we all need to be receiving handling fees. Again, HWMA and Recology have not been receiving handling fees. And one of the things that we all felt would be um, important is that we would be able to temporarily allow for an increase of the allowable daily load limits of CRV material to pre-2014 limits. Uh, what does that mean? If you were to bring in material into HWMA or any uh, CRV uh, site in the state of California, you are only allowed to bring in 100 pounds of aluminum, 100 pounds of plastic, and 1,000 pounds of glass. Now, before 20 of 2014, you were allowed to bring 500 pounds, 500 pounds, and 2,500 pounds of glass. Um, so what we would like to see is a, a temporary uh, increase of, so that we could get rid of that backlog of material that has been accumulating in uh, residents. And then, of course, uh, that we could find a way to uh, be eligible for some form of shore up provision or adjustment uh, to the recycling, uh, excuse me, to Cal Recycles processing fees so that we can uh, be reimbursed our unrecovered cost. The second part of the concept um, has been pretty uh, interesting. Uh, examining the potential role that reverse vending machines could have. And uh, what we've been talking about uh, conceptually is that reverse vending machines could be um, placed either at a willing obligated retailer location or on municipal owned properties such as the library, city hall, or some other sort of uh, public facility. Uh, it would be serviced by one or potentially all three recyclers. We're still, you know, uh, all having those conversations. And we um, had a conversation with the manufacturer around the possibility of HWMA having employees trained uh, so that they could be dispatched and perform any sort of um, uh, equipment malfunction or uh, maintenance repair of the equipment. Otherwise, the uh, manufacturer has to dispatch somebody from out of state. So we were trying to figure out how we could be um, uh, resilient within our, our little community here. Um, and the hope was that we would be able to use grant funds in order to uh, have uh, site development as well as the reverse vending machine uh, purchase. Um, I want to just quickly acknowledge this is not a stock photo. Uh, this is a result of our director of operations, Eric Keller Heckman, uh, visiting his family about two weeks ago in Portland area. And he was able to go to this facility and he was uh, able to get some photos and able to have some limited access uh, to see the internal workings of, of the unit itself and how material comes in and out uh, of the facility. Very clean uh, sort of layout. Obviously they had to make a, a building modification in order to accommodate this cargo uh, kind of style uh, container. So, um, you know, after uh, the October uh, Board of Supervisors meeting, I requested that Cal Recycle send uh, these convenient zone maps for, dis uh, for discussion, as well as so that we could forward this to county staff. Um, I want to make sure that we're able to help them in whatever way we can. Uh, so this map was provided to us on November 6th. And yes, that is not our type of being the city of McKinleyville. Um, the city of Myrtle Town is, an, is, an, is a new community as, as well as another a number of other other folks. Um, but um, let's see here. We've got da -da -da -da. Uh, 
So some of the considerations that you know we wanted to make sure that we had on the board's um, you know radar is number one, what is the competitiveness of submitting a third application to vie for a single remaining slot? As we talked about in September, we were aware that there were more applications than they had slots, and uh, today there's only one slot. Um, at the time that I wrote this, there's only one slot that's remaining. Uh, we also needed to assess the potential inclusion of other jurisdictions, as well as their willingness to enter into a memorandum of agreement uh, with the County of Humboldt. And if a pilot program is uh, approved, convenient zones within the entire program area will be considered to serve, thereby relieving all obligated uh, CRV retailers of their responsibility to redeem materials or pay the $100 day fine. Um, there is a legislative end date, which is July 1st of 2022, after which all operators will be required to revert and comply with the regular cow recycle operational requirements. Now, one of the things that uh, was really troubling, and it was uh, the primary reason that I had a conversation with cow re recycle staff most recently on October 29th, was this provision. Uh, when we started diving into some of the details to evaluate um, developing a, a project proposal, um, in the legislation itself, this is where I had to find this, um, I, I said, can you please clarify that this is accurate, or maybe I am simply misinterpreting something, hoping I was. Um, pilot project re uh, recyclers shall pay the refund value of no more than 25 pounds of aluminum or plastic beverage containers or 250 pounds of glass. This is a 75% reduction of what we are currently able to receive um, at our facilities now. So I shared with uh, Cal Recycle staff that this uh, might be reasonable as far as um, reverse vending machine operators or even those um, uh, recycling centers that are in more urban areas where they have more opportunity and people are bringing in smaller volumes of uh, material. It is an unreasonable constraint uh, to the recycling centers who are capable of handling the existing allowable daily load limits of the 100 pounds of aluminum uh, and plastic containers and glass. And additionally, many, many, many Humboldt County residents live in outlying areas and they only come into town every few weeks or month or sometimes less frequent than that. So that's when they bring their material in. And as part of our conceptual proposal, we were hoping uh, to propose a temporary increase of that allowable daily load limit to the pre-2014 limits uh, in order to um, address the accumulated materials that many North Coast uh, consumers have stored. Cal Recycle's response was that the pilot project uh, legislation restricts allowable loads to the adjusted standard of the 25 pounds, uh, and there is no provision for more material as that poundage was based on the average consumer uh, load. And alternatively, they did say um, that um, you know, non-pilot project recycling centers, so if HWMA was not to be involved, we would be able to continue to be um, uh, allowed that limit of 100 pounds, uh, 100 pounds and 1,000 pounds of glass, but we would not be receiving those handling fees, nor would we be able to have the pilot project allowance such as appointments. Now, as previously noted, the pilot program allows for the approval of no more than five projects, each uh, with the uh, potential funding of up to $1 million each. And as described in September, Cal Recycle staff had uh, described that two jurisdiction uh, pro uh, projects had been approved earlier in the year, a third was pending, and that there were four applications that were under consideration for the uh, two remaining slots. Now, Culver City applied for their application in September, and they were uh, announced uh, as an award in February. Uh, they then began working with their recycler, and they just began project implementation a little over a week ago on October 30th. Um, the city of San Francisco submitted their application in fall of 2019, and uh, they also were the second one to be announced uh, for February of 2020. I'm uh, not certain that they have a recycler yet, but I know that they have no implementation uh, as of this date. When I had a conversation with their uh, coordinator for this project, they were still looking to secure um, 
probably a few million uh, dollars more for their project. With respect to the San Mateo, that was uh, approved on October 2nd of uh, just this last month. Uh, I don't know for certain what their submittal date is, and I don't know what where they are in their implementation. Uh, they will obviously be working with a recycler. I'm not certain that they have secured one at this time. The most recent one was City of Irvine, and when I contacted them, they were a little shocked that I had found out. I'm not sure where I found it out from, um, but they applied a year ago and they just received their approval to move forward uh, about mid-month and they are working with a recycler uh, with their application right now and they don't have uh, an anticipated start date they're they're thinking it's going to be sometime uh, in the beginning maybe the beginning part of the year maybe mid-year before they're there so that remained one slot and there were two applications that have been under uh, ongoing uh, consideration now, this past Tuesday, as in two days ago, November uh, 10th, I was informed that the fifth slot had been awarded uh, and they had awarded, Cal Recycle awarded that on November 6th. And this was obviously a surprise and a disappointment uh, because we had received the convenient zones from Cal Recycle on uh, November 6th, as well as the release of our board agenda for the meeting um, uh, for this meeting this evening. Uh, Hambro representatives uh, had contacted me on Tuesday morning and I thank them very much. We do have them here on the line with us because they were curious whether or not um, we had received the approval uh, because they had initiated their pilot project uh, process essentially last January. Uh, they had the formal submittal uh, to Cal Recycle in uh, March. And I explained that we were still in the concept phase and we were bringing this item to uh, the board this evening so no we're not the ones that bump them so obviously um, where this fundamentally changes our our board our, our recommendation uh, to the board uh, because everything that we were going to ask for is now moot uh, there are simply no available slots to apply for um, you know uh, this is Pretty frustrating uh, all around. You know, the state of CRV uh, redemption is continuing to adversely affect Humboldt residents and our businesses, and we desperately need to have our legislative representatives make a concerted approach to address and reform the bottle bill. So under the umbrella of other direction as appropriate, um, I am asking that the um, board uh, consider making a uh, legislative relief request. It is important that a viable and comprehensive reform be developed and in an expeditious manner. Um, HWMA is aware that Cal Recycle has submitted uh, the notices to the retailers of their obligation to redeem CRV uh, containers and the likelihood is that they are going to resist development of redemption centers on their sites, preferring instead to pay the $100 a day fine. But ultimately, it's not the retailer that's paying that fine. It's the consumer that is going to pay the fine through an increase um, at the till, whatever that looks like. So we're, you know, paying the, the CRV deposit, and now we're going to have to pay a fine for not being able to get our CRV deposits back. And in light of the fact the fifth uh, pilot project was awarded and recognizing that the pilot project um, program was legislatively created as a result of CRV center closure staff is asking that the board authorize the chair to submit a letter to our state representatives asking that they sponsor temporarily uh, legislative action and relief until a bottle bill reform is in place that would enable and provide recyclers and rural communities like Humboldt the temporary ability to develop an appointment-based model to model uh, to modify our hours of operation as appropriate for our community and not be state mandated and to increase the allowable daily load limits to pre-2014 and to receive handling fees and to have a regional adjustment of uh, processing fees and you know frankly you know uh, just put those into play until the CRV's uh, bottle bill program has been reformed. Um, 
I would also ask that if the board authorizes the chair to put um, a letter together to our state representatives, that each member on our board bring and introduce a, uh, a request for similar action uh, by your agencies themselves. Um, you know, this essentially concludes my, my presentation. It has been just a, a whipsaw, uh, obviously, uh, not, not anticipating that they were going to be um, awarding that fifth slot, <laughs> certainly not while uh, we were having a, a ongoing conversations. A uh, little heads up would have been really helpful because I can't begin to tell you how many hours um, that we have all put into uh, this particular effort. This does conclude my uh, presentation. I am available for questions, but I do want to note uh, that we have Linda Wise, General Manager of Ecology with us. We have Tasha Eisner with Humboldt Sanitation. We have Joe Perez. He is the Business Development manager of Tomra. He's the uh, reverse vending machine. Uh, we also have, um, I want to introduce Jeff uh, Dunlevy. He's the general <laughs> manager of Ming's Recycling. And um, they uh, purchased a lot of the material from Humble's, uh, from HWMA, Humsan, and uh, Recology. Uh, but probably of interest to you all is that Jeff is a member of the statewide commission on recycling markets and curbside uh, recycling. And so he may have some uh, interesting perspectives and input uh, in here. So I would certainly ask if uh, any of them would like to uh, address the board, they'd be given the opportunity. So I'm, I'm really sorry. I know this comes as a big surprise. Again, uh, we've all been caught really uh, blindsided by this. Yes, thank you, Jill. So regarding the upcoming movie, the, the uh, decision on the genre has not been made. It's, it's either gonna be a horror film or a comedy. Um, so that decision will be made uh, relatively soon, I would think. So it seems like maybe some of our guests have them speak to this issue first and then go to board members. Does that make sense? Uh, your, your preference. Yeah. Okay. So why don't we do that? Should we start with Tony? Uh, Tony. Like to speak <laughs> this issue? Have anything to add or say? Uh, uh, yeah, or Linda? Oh. I hear somebody and I can't figure out who it is. Yeah, I can't hear him. He unmuted. Tony can. I have, I have nothing to add. No. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, man. And how about Jeff? No, nothing to add. Yes, okay. no, I do. Thank you. I was, I was getting unmuted. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah, so, so thank you for, for having me. Um, I'm based in Sacramento and I do work for. Ming's Resources. Uh, we <clears throat> have facilities in Sacramento and Hayward. We're one of the largest state certified processors in the state. And we buy from most of the recycling centers in Northern California. And over the past few years, we've seen a lot of our customers uh, go out of business. And mainly for the, the reasons that uh, Jill had presented. And uh, that was a fantastic presentation going over the pilot programs. Um, and my heart goes out to, to you and the whole group for the frustrations that you've gone through because Ming's also applied for uh, one of the pilot programs and uh, we were with the city of Folsom, Sacramento County, and we were awarded one of the pilot spots, but uh, that was in March. And unfortunately in March, uh, COVID hit everybody and things started shutting down. But as things uh, were affected by COVID, the market value for aluminum and PET uh, drastically dropped. And the, the finances for the program became um, very bad. So we decided in May to withdraw our application. But during the process working with staff, and I think the intent of the legislation to get uh, some pilot programs, some innovation was, was good, but we did run into some bureaucratic difficulties with the process. And I feel bad that they were soliciting an application when they had several others in the pipe. Um, 
it doesn't seem very good. For us, uh, they started asking for sign leases for all the locations. It became very difficult and challenging. And uh, that also added to one of the reasons that we pulled out of the program. Um, but with the, the pilot program, the thing that I would mention at this point is it is just temporary and they are scheduled to end July 2022. So uh, the Culver City program has uh, 18 to 19 months to operate. The other programs that uh, Jill had mentioned, I don't know that they're going to start in the next six months. Um, so they might only have 12 months of operation unless legislation next session extends them. Uh, with the legislation for pilot programs, it's just temporary. And what the bottle bill needs um, is long-term comprehensive reform. Uh, we don't need temporary fixes. Um, I think uh, through all the stakeholders, whether it's the north part of the state like you're in or the south part of the state, um, everybody knows the situation and the things that need to be corrected. It's just um, putting together that comprehensive reform um, that allows recycling centers in, in rural areas like yours uh, to exceed a load limit by taking the person's ID, knowing who that person is, where they're coming from, and making sure that it's eligible material. Uh, so you don't have to have somebody show up to your facility with 110 pounds of material uh, to tell them that you can't pay them for it because it exceeds that, that amount. So we do need comprehensive reform. Um, Jill, could you pull up the, the slides that, that I had sent you? Uh, and it, um, keep talking, I'll have to do okay. a little um, juggling there because that, that came in, yeah. A little after five. That, and, uh, no, no, that, uh, I'm working on two computers. All right. And Jill did mention that I am a part of the AB 1583 uh, Recycling Commission, and we are addressing issues related to the recycling markets, mainly the curbside program um, and the organics. We have four subcommittees that are looking at recycling, um, organics collection, and then a labeling committee and a market development committee. And assembly member Eggman um, authored the bill to provide uh, a commission of 17 people uh, to come up with policy recommendations that would go to the legislature to help cities and counties and the state improve their recycling programs, um, hopefully to improve the quality of the material, uh, and in some cases reduce what they're, they're putting in their bin. So uh, we're not doing any wish cycling. We're, we're hoping to recycle something because it has a recycling symbol, uh, but in, in truth, it ends up uh, in some country, someplace, and we don't know what's happening to it. So. Uh, the commission is working on that. Uh, we do have a website that uh, has all the meetings and all the notes and uh, more information to follow. We have a commission meeting next Wednesday um, and anybody's welcome to uh, attend via GoToMeetings. And at the end of my presentation, I can get you information on that. Jill, do you have the slides? No. Nope. Uh -oh. it's, still, it's still sending. It's um, welcome to living up in the rural areas. <laughs> <laughs> Internet speed. Too many um, birds on the line. Huh? <laughs> with with the pilot programs, I, I can speak to a few of them. Uh, the one in Culver City, uh, what I do know of it, um, it does not bring a lot of innovation to the program. Uh, I think what they're allowing is a recycler in a truck to operate three days a week at different grocery stores. Yeah. So it's allowing them to operate fewer hours um, when the requirement is a recycling center has to operate for 30 hours a week. So it, it appears it was just a small variation that they've authorized. Mm -hmm. um, so that program will have two locations that will provide service six days a week 
But the trade-off is all the stores and all the dealers in Culver City are now exempt from the in-store take back. So uh, the question is, is the pilot program more convenient than having all the stores take the material back? That's kind of the big question with all the pilot programs. Uh, the San Francisco program, um, if that were to start, I believe right now they're talking about four locations uh, that they would service uh, a few times a week. And right now there's over 350 stores in the city of San Francisco that are required to take back material in the store. And if they begin the pilot program, all of those stores would now be exempt. So it's a question of if that probability from the stores. And then the Irvine program, uh, what I did hear about it is it would be a door-to-door -door program that is not allowed now um, where they would go and set up appointments and pick up material. Um, that would be new, different, uh, but the concern or the question is the cost of such a program. Um, that might work in Southern California with a high density housing. Um, I'm not sure something like that would work statewide when you run into a lot of uh, rural areas, especially in Northern California. Mm -hmm. And then the fifth one that was awarded, um, I'm not sure what that one was, but again, uh, only one is operating. Uh, the other three or four will have about 18 months to demonstrate their services, and then, that, then they would end unless legislation is signed by the governor uh, by September 2021 to extend them. But I think at this point, as uh, uh, Jill had mentioned, some long-term comprehensive reform needs to take place to fix a lot of issues within the program. Um, Jeff, it, my, my, it's still sending from, uh, from me. I don't know if maybe you have the ability to share. Jill, I how are you doing? I'm sorry. I've got, he, asked, doing, he, he asked how you were doing. So you're um, saying. You yeah, it's, it's still sending. Um, so my suggestion is Tyler, if, uh, can he share his screen? Do you have your presentation on your screen there? Jeff? Fortunately, I cannot share my screen. Okay, so uh, so in this case, we're just gonna have to wait. <laughs> Cause it's okay. like, yeah, I, unfortunately, if anytime I get something, it takes like 15 minutes. Uh, it's just a, you know, limitations by. Um, you but know, Jeff, what did the screen say? Um, it had different slides that I wanted it to go through, but um, there's areas where the program works and there's areas where the program doesn't work. You mean Northern the CRV Cali program? What was that? You mean the CRV program? Yeah, the CRV program is very complex and it has different formulas on how recycling centers are paid. And they look at the statewide average uh, of costs. So they'll sample the costs up in Humboldt County and they'll also sample the costs down in the Bay Area or Bakersfield. They'll come up with an average and that determines what processing payments recycling centers get throughout the state. The problem that you run into is if you're a, a lower volume, higher cost operation, you don't get paid what you need uh, to stay in business. If you're a lower cost op operation or in a market that you have access to the processors, you might do very well. So in Bakersfield, there's about 80 recycling centers for 800,000 people. So one recycling center for every 10,000 people. The formula is really working for those people down there. In the Bay Area, we have 12 recycling centers for about 5 million people. And those recycling centers are all struggling. But the problem with those recycling centers is they have lines from eight in the morning until five at night. 
And because they're running so many containers through their system, they're showing up as the lowest cost operators in the state. So they're actually pulling down the subsidy that all the other operators get because they're the only operators in the Bay Area. And the problem that creates, especially in the rural areas, is you don't get paid what you need to get your material to market because your volume just doesn't support it. Um, I had a chance to look at the pilot program up there and uh, the introduction of innovation, um, RVMs, bag drops, uh, things that they have up in Oregon are very good. They're very convenient, but your program would have to have a recycling center that's operating. And if you implemented the reverse vending machines up there, the reverse vending machines would be competing against your recycling centers. So, and you wouldn't have a way to um, offset those costs. The solution up in the North area is the recycling centers, they need to be paid more. They need a higher processing payment than what they're getting. And in Jill's uh, presentation, uh, she definitely addressed that. And that's part of what the comprehensive reform uh, needs. One of the slides I was gonna show you is I got how does, I was looking for the perfect break. Um, let me uh, share my screen. Okay. And, um, get this up for you. Give me half a minute. Um, share screen here. Can you all see this? Yes. And Jeff, you just tell me when to advance. Okay. Broken system, and it's a and we have a growing fund. I'll go to the next slide. And again, this is uh, Kenny and Kevin Luong. Um, their family immigrated from uh, Vietnam uh, back in the mid 80s. And uh, Kenny has grown the business to be one of the largest processors in the state of California. And the business became so successful that his brother, Kevin, who's an orthopedic surgeon, has come back into the business as uh, our chief operating officer. So. Yeah. Great family business to work for. Um, right now, the state has 1,200 and actually 19 recycling centers. And there's areas that are very well served, like LA County, Tulare County, and Kern County. Uh, there's a lot of convenience down in Southern California. But if you get into the Bay Area, um, San Mateo, there's two recycling centers and each one is servicing about 370,000 people. They're overwhelmed with material and people don't wanna stand in line for, for two hours. So they're putting it in their curbside bin. San Francisco, there's only one recycling center for uh, just under 900,000 people. So uh, the reason that there's so few is the formula just doesn't pay enough to operate in the Bay Area. And uh, those that are, are surviving, they have other businesses that are most likely subsidizing their CRV operation right now. So if you go to the next slide. So your neck of the woods, the, the Northwest coast is barren. Uh, that's a long drive for anybody and everybody, um, which is very unfortunate. That's not the intent of the program. It was to provide conven convenience um, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, down in Bakersfield, there's a lot of recycling centers. If you look at the Burbank Van Nuys area, it's about one recycling center for every 15,000 people. And the difference between Bakersfield and Van Nuys and the North Coast is those recyclers can take their material to market the next day. The people in the North, the North Coast will have to stockpile a full truckload of material before they go to market uh, in Sacramento or San Francisco to reduce their transportation costs. But in the South, um, uh, they could put it in a pickup truck and drive three or four or 10 miles uh, to sell their material. Uh, so they don't have to have um, a big float, a high inventory of material. So 
Um, the people in the North Coast definitely need more support. Uh, the people in the South area, um, they're doing very well the way the formula works right now. And that's where the, the reform has to take place is uh, the way the formula is working is it's just a death spiral. Uh, the higher cost operators, um, every week, every month, a few more are falling off because they're deciding to close. So next slide. Jim. Yeah, you got it. Okay. I want to talk to you about the beverage container fund. Uh, the surplus is growing. Uh, Tower Cycle started publishing uh, 24 months of data. So they're going back 24 months and they're showing container sales, container returns, um, and they're breaking it down by recycling centers and curbside programs. So what we're looking at here is the comparison of September 2019 to August 2020, comparing it to September 2018 to August 2019. What's happened in the last 12 months is the recycling rate has dropped below 70%, a big drop in recycling centers because recycling centers have closed uh, back in August of 2019. That's when Replanet closed and then from March through June, uh, the state was affected by uh, stay-at-home orders, um, so people weren't going to recycling centers. On the other hand, the curbside programs have seen a significant increase in volume. Um, people wanted to recycle the, using the convenience of the curbside containers, uh, so the curbside programs have seen an increase. Um, container sales, over the last 12 months are up 6%. Um, everybody's staying at home and drinking beverages instead of going to restaurants or bars and drinking there. So beverage sales are up and container returns are also down because there's fewer recycling centers and people have used curbside programs more than recycling centers. At the end of the day, what that means is the fund with all the money in and all the money out has grown by over a hundred million dollars. So there's an extra hundred million dollars or more in the beverage container fund. And there's a lot of people that know it. And anytime a state fund has extra money, there's going to be people coming out of the woodworks looking to use that money. And one of the issues that, Hopefully uh, your organization and others uh, will say that that money is consumer's money and it should be used to fund redemption centers in underserved areas or to introduce um, new redemption opportunities or new technology. Um, so uh, the other item, curbside programs, and this isn't uh, an attack on the curbside programs, but in the last 12 months, because more material has moved into the curbside programs, um, they've seen just under a $12 million increase in payments to the curbside programs. The unfortunate trade-off is consumers have seen about a $53 million decrease in what consumers have received. So the fund has a lot of money. As we head into the legislative session, um, we have to figure out what kind of reform we need and how the additional money should be used. Because I think that the fund is gonna continue to grow over the next few months um, as COVID remains with us and different counties are rolling back from the orange to the purple. Hopefully we don't go into the red again. Um, so I think the fund, unfortunately, is probably going to be growing in the next few months. So if you could go to the next slide. The stores are required to have a recycling center within a half mile. In rural areas, it's three miles. Uh, a lot of the major brands are very concerned with this because, as Jill had mentioned, they're getting enforcement orders. And it's through no fault of their own. Um, that recycling centers have closed. Um, less than three out of 10 stores are served 
with a recycling center, but there's a big flaw in the program, in the bottle bill, because it requires the dealers to take containers back and give people their nickels back. But the program does not allow the dealers to get their nickels back because they're uncertified entities. And if the Safeway or the Costco gives out 100 nickels and they take it to the Eel River Recycling Center, um, the Eel River Recycling Center is not allowed to pay them CRV because they're not allowed to buy material from uncertified entities. So the stores are required to take it back, but they don't get paid. They basically have to eat it. And that's a big flaw in the program. And there's several of, of the major chains that have gotten very active in the past few months, and they do want to get fixed. They do want to fix the program. If they have to take it back, all they're asking is they want to get paid for providing that service. So if you go to the next slide. A lot of people have seen the Oregon program. Uh, they have a wonderful system up there. Um, they have reverse vending machines. They have bag drop programs, very clean and efficient, uh, but they do cost more than what the current system is paying. But uh, talking to some of the grocers, I think uh, they're, they're willing to help out with the cost provided they get high quality service like this. So if you go to the next slide, um, bag drop complements reverse vending machines. Reverse vending machines is a way for um, immediate payment. You, get, you can get your money back, but then there's also a touchless uh, bag drop program. And this is what the San Francisco program is thinking about introducing, but basically consumers put their material in a bag in their garage when they have one or two or three bags, um, they take it to a drop off location and then they're electronically paid for their material a few days later. Whether it's reverse vending machines or bad drop, they're great innovative programs, uh, but they do cost more. Um, but right now, bag drop is not allowed under the current bottle bill. And there's, uh, again, some formula issues with the reverse vending machines that would need to be fixed to make those a better solution for what we're doing. So if you go to the next slide. So the next steps, I mean, we, we have to get some comprehensive reform. We got to help the recycling centers. Financially, we got to fix the formulas. And I think there's several people that that know the, the bill well enough um, that we can do it. But it is a major, major issue. Um, the grocers, they just want to be paid for their service. It's a fair ask. It's an easy ask. Um, but it's going to be a big ask. Um, so, And then there's some discussion with the grocers about uh, forming uh, co-ops. So up in your area, uh, the grocers, they could pay $3,000 a month to get out of the program. And if you have 10 grocers up there that don't want to take the material back in the store, and it's completely understandable why they wouldn't, uh, they just have to pay $3,000 $3, a month. So if you have 10 stores in Eureka, they would be sending $30,000 a month to Sacramento which would do nothing to help open up a redemption center in Eureka. So there's some discussion with grocers being able to band together and say in Eureka, what do we need? Do we need 10 recycling centers around our stores? Probably not. Do we need one or two good recycling centers? Yeah. So how do we band together as a group and prop up the recycling center that's in our area. So there's going to be some discussion about that. And then the item that I'm bringing up is making sure that within the legislation that if there's any surplus funds available, that they're designated to be used um, to establish and support redemption locations. Um, anytime there's been surplus funds, there's been special projects, um, uh, they pulled $5 million out 
uh, in the last budget and they gave it to low volume recycling centers. And the low volume recycling centers um, weren't the ones that were hurting the most from the closure of the replanted um, sites. It was more of the higher volume ones. So, and then getting cow recycle in the game. Right now, cow recycle is a referee. Uh, they call balls and strikes, but they don't call any plays. Uh, cow recycle needs to have the authority to make some changes. Right now, they're very constrained by the legislation. And I think they know where the problems are and what some of the solutions are. Uh, they just need the ability to call the plays and have some funds where they could prop up redemption centers, especially in the underserved areas. So um, those are kind of the key items with the long-term reform that we need. So if you go to the next slide. So next session, I mean, it's, it's starting in a few weeks and going into January. Um, we need to some, need to see some big, big reform. Um, uh, there's potential legislation where they might look at a tax on uh, wine and spirits to try and set up their own program. Um, there is a ballot initiative that I think is going November of 2022 that would be a penny tax on single use plastic. Um, neither of those address the CRV program in the short term. Um, but they could be detrimental to the program in the long term. Um, hopefully, this session we'll see some some long term reform, um, as Jill had pointed out, and some of the items that that I've addressed here tonight um, that can change things. Because the people in Crescent City or Eureka, they want to recycle, they want to get their nickels and dimes back, and they don't want it to be a tax. Um, so they're entitled to their money back. The fund has money in it. We need to find a way to take care of the recycling centers or open up new recycling centers or redemption programs like RVMs or bag drop in these underserved areas. So we got a big challenge going into the next session and with uh, groups like yours helping out, sending letters to your assembly and senators, letting them know that you want your nickels and dimes back and come up with a solution it's going to help. So I'm available for questions. Thank you. <clears throat> very good, Jeff. Thank you so much. That was very informative, if not overwhelming. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. So are there any questions from board members? Can we use the roll call, please, Tyler? Is Tyler oh. still awake? <laughs> Tyler, where are you? He's there. He's there. Bone. Is Bone still awake? You there, Rex? He was there. <laughs> Maybe he went down. Uh, he, uh, I'm sorry, he's not on the call anymore. That was my bad. No, he was just there a moment ago. Like, yeah, that's that's okay. He's not now. I will move on while we wait to see if he reconnects. <clears throat> Castellano. Um, I don't know if I have questions right now. I feel like I kind of just need a moment to absorb all this. Um, I, I appreciate the all of the information. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Leslie. Hogan. Yeah, thank you very much, Jill and Jeff, for all of that information. Um, at this point, I feel like there are people like yourselves um, and the people that are in the commissions and the committees that you're working with who know the solution and who you know are working with legislative policy analysts um, to draft legislation and whatnot. Um, and at this point, what I'm kind of wondering is how far are we in this um, to be able to present something actually to our legislators that they can actually 
you know, work with and then, and then bring in to the legislature in this next session. Um, it sounds like there are a lot of great ideas and a lot of people that know what needs to happen. And so, um, you know, I know there's a lot going on in, in government always. And so how close are you to kind of having something that, that's actually in draft form to present um, as far as a synopsis of the ideas, that's something that's workable that they can actually present and, and do something with and maybe make some changes. Can you speak to that uh, as far as where we are in the process? I'll give you my first blush and Jeff might have some uh, additional uh, insight in here, but quite frankly, I think that there's a there's a, a lot of issues. We certainly can provide uh, information around what it would take to help um, Northern California, but I want to know that's behind the redwood curtain. And I do want to note that we do have uh, representatives of Hambro, uh, you know, also watching um, our meeting this evening. Um, but you know, we share the same challenges uh, within our communities. So you know. The information that we've presented is, quote, our pilot project. This is what, in part, we need to help make this more viable for us. Um, as Jeff was speaking around the need for um, processing fees and to have some adjustment, one of the components that I think is going to be really important is having a regional um, correcting factor so we can address some of the inequities that, uh, that occur on that front. Now, the bigger issue really comes into at the point that you start introducing legislation, you're going to have all the lobbyists coming in. There are a lot of people who want to have a particular, you know, uh, seat at the table and some people are going to want more than they're going to, you know, push others off to the side. Uh, we really just need to have a concerted effort by our state representatives to make that commitment to fundamentally examine, reform, and rebuild this thing if we are going to have a viable um, solution. It is completely inappropriate that um, California consumers, um, you know, as Jeff just noted, $116 million in excess funding, and we are not being able to avail to get that money back out to the consumers. Um, so um, there's, it, it's complicated. It's not, I mean, obviously, um, this is, there have actually been several runs in the last few years to fundamentally address some issues around the bottle bill, and they're not really getting anywhere. And part of what they need to hear is from you guys, the locally elected officials from all of your cities. They need to hear that this is an important issue, that you're representing your constituency, and that their job is to figure out what the fix is going to be so that we can implement it and take care of our people. So yeah, if I could just add. Uh, yeah. If, if I could just add, uh, something needs to be introduced in January or February to work its way through the process. Um, the major stakeholders in the bottle bill are the beverage manufacturers, the grocers, the haulers, the distributors. Um, they all have very good, uh, strong lobbyists. Um, the people that have, I'll say the weakest voice are the recycling centers and the consumers. So when it gets down to the local level with groups like yours, talking to your elected officials, um, you're speaking for your local consumers. So it definitely helps with that communication. Um, going into this session, um, I think there's going to be something that, that, that happens because there's so much frustration with the bottle bill. Um, I think there's a lot of interest into what they're doing with the stewardship organization up in Oregon. Um, it seems to be working very well. The convenience is there. Uh, the consumer satisfaction is there. And it appears that the, the beverage manufacturers and the grocers, they're all getting along. Um, the biggest difference between the Oregon program and the California program is in California, our waste haulers get paid uh, CRV for the material that they collect and it is a very large amount and it affects everybody's monthly trash bill by about two to three dollars a month and in Oregon they don't pay the haulers for that so that's a big difference so in California if they were to try and switch to a program similar to Oregon and the haulers did not uh, maintain what they're getting now uh, it could be a big rate increase um, for all the programs because the haulers are using the CRV money that they're collecting to help offset the cost of providing curbside service. So it's, it's a really big number 
Um, and that would affect everybody in the state. So something needs to happen. Um, hopefully the big stakeholders can all um, come up with, with these solutions. And I think uh, with what Jill's address uh, and what I brought up, it's kind of along the lines with what people are thinking. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Jeff. Other questions from the board? Wilson. Wilson. I Who's up to speak? I am I up to speak? You're yeah. up. Next up. Yeah. Second. Okay. Well, my question is, um, I could start with Jeff and go to wherever it goes. My understanding was that from what we've had in previous meetings, of, unless I misunderstood it, the recyclers, all the recyclers get is what they sell the, they, they pay the the CRV money to the customer when they came in. So they pay their, their nickel for the bottle. And then all they get out of that is that they get to uh, sell, the, sell the bottle. But from what Jeff is explaining, there, there's money coming from the state back to the recyclers for that CRV? Yeah, the processing fee. Yeah. So Frank, you'll recall that we talked about uh, <clears throat> HWMA receives a portion of the processing fee in addition to the scrap value of the material that we sell. And the processing fee is insufficient and the scrap value of the material has been depressed for some time. Where, where did I miss this in the, the conversation that we're getting the processing fee? I mean, it's what I, what I understood was that you, the recycler paid $1.65 a pound for aluminum for the, mm -hmm. for the cans right and they were able to sell those for 40 for for 40 dollars or for uh, for 40 cents a pound. Mm -hmm. that was the scrap value but we also receive a small processing fee and i don't have those uh figures but that helps for us to get reimbursed for the crv the scrap value is not covering our cost of labor overhead uh equipment or the freight to market well, I understand that completely. Yeah. So what what does the processing fee amount to? I don't have that number off the top of my head. Um, Tyler? Let, 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 let me jump in. Let me jump in real quick. So the processing fee was to offset the cost of operation. So let's talk uh, aluminum cans do not have a processing fee because the recyclers are living off of the scrap value. So they're returning a nickel for every container, and then they're able to sell the aluminum as scrap. You can sell it in California, you can sell it in Nevada, you can sell it in Alabama and get that scrap value. All you get is scrap value. You get scrap value, and that's enough to cover your cost. And I'll say for aluminum cans, in today's market, somebody might be getting $800 a ton for that material, and it costs them $500 a ton to process it. So they're, they're making $300 a ton, so they're, they're doing okay on aluminum. The problem that you run into is with plastic, and if plastic has a processing cost of $500, but in today's market, the recyclers are only getting $200 a ton, they're losing money. So that's when the state comes in with a $300 a ton processing payment to offset the difference between your processing costs and the scrap value. But they look at it on a statewide average. So if you have higher than $500 a ton operating costs, because you're a rural or a lower volume site, you start losing money pretty quick. I think the question was, I appreciate, I, I think we all, I'm I understand not that, getting an answer to my question. Is what I I'm, think the question is how much processing are we getting? I mean, I, that, if you can tell us that, that's great, Jeff. Don't, I, I, I know how it's made. I just want to know how much we're getting after it's made. So um, what? So obviously we don't receive any processing fees for aluminum. We heard that. And, okay, and I I'll have to figure out where I put this um, Excel sheet. Um, 
Dun, 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 dun. I've got lots of things around here. Hold on. But it was it was pretty nominal. I want to say it was, I don't know, that's the wrong number in my head. And 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 I'll say, and not to be um, cavalier, but you're getting the same processing payments as the people in Bakersfield. Right. And it's not working because your transportation costs from your area to the Bay Area are $1,200 a load. And in Bakersfield, they're paying $5 to get it to market. There's a big difference right. in costs. And because you're getting the same processing payments based on a statewide average, it's not covering the cost of operations in the, in the higher cost areas. Understood. So, so what CalRecycle does, is they issue these um, on the basis of uh, cost per pound. So the glass is uh, just shy of seven cents uh, for a pound of glass, and the peat is a uh, cent and a half for a pound. Not a unit, but a pound. A cent and a half? Yeah. Cent and a half for a pound. And Jill had mentioned it, but I'll, I'll just reemphasize. 15 or 20 years ago, a recycling center was seeing about 50% of their volume was aluminum cans and 30% was plastic. So they had a higher percentage of higher value material, but now they're getting more plastic at a lower value than aluminum. It's, it's switched. The ratios of aluminum to plastic have switched. So the recycling centers are handling more um, lightweight, lower value material in plastic. And the way the processing payments are calculated is it takes about two years to catch up. So the processing payments that'll go into effect uh, January 1st, 2021 are based on 2019 operating costs. So it, any health insurance, any wages, any increases that, that they've incurred in the last two years, they have to eat. So it's a very slow formula uh, to catch up. And that's one of the recommendations will be to um, change the timing of the cost studies and how quick they, they adjust the processing payments. Hopefully that helps. Well, yeah, yeah. I hear, I hear parts of this, but I guess this, this part with the processing fee, we, we're getting, seven cents a pound for glass on top of whatever you get for whatever you sell your glass for. Well, I'm just going to point out that glass is oftentimes a marginal or negative valued commodity right now. And it has been for quite some time. And I understand that, but we're, but we are receiving the processing fees for glass and plastic, a cent and seven cents a pound or a cent, uh, a cent and a half. So if you, um, I don't have, uh, the th thing in front of me. Um, so if you, if you look at what our net and loss by material per um, ton is, we are negative $85 a ton and we are net for glass and we are negative $553 a ton for the peat plastic. And that is with the processing fee that is, is provided by Cal Recycle, and that is with the scrap value that we are selling this material on market. And it is the you know underlying reason um, that recycling centers, especially um, you know located up here in, in Northern California, other areas, were operating in a deficit. And so um, you know that's that's the undercurrent of, of what's happened. Now, aluminum, we're not receiving processing fees, but at the point that we are uh, covering all of our costs, we're making $4.28 a ton. We still make some money on cardboard. We still make some money on our other white goods, which help to subsidize our overall operations. So we yes. do make money on aluminum? $4.28 a ton. How much do we lose on plastic? 500 and? 53. And glass is 80? Five. 85? Yes. And we make plus $4 on aluminum. Correct. How, how do we make $4 on aluminum if we pay $1.65 a pound for the, for the, for the uh, recycle at CRV and then we sell it for 
roughly forty dollars a a pound. Okay. That's where it comes into basically an economy of scale. You've got to have sufficient volume coming in and there's a point where you finally break uh, in, in terms of being, it's, it's not a direct linear relationship there, um, but you get a, a sufficient uh, volume of material in and at some point you've covered all of your costs and then you begin to uh, make uh, money, if you will, on it. You. We'll have to talk later. I'm just, it's. Uh, Beyond me, how you can pay a dollar sixty-five a pound and sell it for forty cents, and how you can ever come out. I mean, you're yeah. four to one. I'm I'm Jeff, I you collect a billion tons, and you just so, four to one. Frank and Rex, just so we're clear, the one sixty-five that we pay out, we get that back reimbursed from the processor. Understood. Less, yeah. less a percentage. So when we pay one sixty-five a ton, when we provide that material to the processor, the processor reimburses us that outlay that nickel, that nickel. yeah okay exactly. that's, no, that's no. Part that i've never heard before well i mean and i'm just i'm just gonna say i i can't support another letter to woods and mcguire i mean i mean these guys i mean ray charles can see there's a problem here and they know very well there's a problem i just got off the phone with them today i was there last week at cal recycle i'm here you know we hear about this pilot program they won't accept this they won't accept that the pilot program was just what it was supposed to be. We were supposed to be innovative and say, this is the way we want to do it. We want to do A through L on Mondays and Wednesdays. And we want to do, we, this is what we want to do because it is a pilot program. And as, and pilot programs aren't, aren't just going to shut off in 2022. If there's one successful, they're going to finance it. That's the whole idea. Private business and public has pilot programs to see what works, but this is our third meeting in a row on this, and I've, I'm pretty much come to the resilient. And I told somebody that we would probably never do recycling again here. So I think I'm right, because we don't want to do it. We can't do it. We, we're too small. We can't go anywhere else to do it. We can't do that. We can't do this. I've heard all the can'ts, so we just can't. And But I think we need to be honest with the supply, the consumer, much like our CPI index and you know. Our, 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 and everything else, rural gets screwed. We uh, we follow a San Francisco CPI, but we sometimes have a little bit difference up here. Sometimes, depending where we're at. So what I'm saying is, we need to be honest with the consumer because we're talking about the same thing we talked about in the September meeting. I'm looking at them and the October meeting, and we're not any closer. Except we've spent a lot of hours putting a pilot program together that now that they were holding for a rural. And it's been out there for 16 months and we just finally got on it three months ago. So what I'm saying is we, we really have to be in the long run somewhere. We have to say, instead of working on it, just tell people we're not going to do it. We can recycle it at the, at, if you put it on the curb, we'll recycle it somehow and get it out. So it's not, but I don't know if anybody else has noticed our streets are covered with crap and the whole idea in 1986, because I remember it real well is was to get everything off the streets and now we're not doing it and i know we we subsidize our, our waste disposal to the tune of 900 some odd thousand dollars a year so not mattresses but we can do goods and and offset some of our other expenses i just i think we need to be honest with the consumer because we're not getting any closer we're finding out more stuff tonight we, we got a better breakdown of tonight what's going on but i mean in all honesty we've got to be honest because that's the phone calls we I still get the most of. When are we doing CRV? When are we doing CRV? I got four today. I told them we will not do CRV in the foreseeable future. So Rex, when you spoke with CalRecycle last week, did they indicate that they were on the verge of awarding another applicant? No, okay. no, I didn't think. That, and you know what? That's yeah. that's exactly it. I've been in regular communication with them. They've been nothing but encouraging. Please go do this. And so we've been working on this really hard. We've got Linda and Tasha back to the table and willing to uh, develop a proposal. We have, um, you know, manufacturers person here. So we actually have something that we feel, you know, could have been viable. But I also want to note that Hambro was on the line. Hambro was on the line and they put in their application earlier this year and they were denied also. They are more rural than we are. It, and it, they, were was, they were Humboldt has Humboldt. I mean, if you guys look around, Humboldt, God bless Arcata, has a history in the state of being a more recyclable county than any other county. We have a name. I mean, we got all this crap because of Wesley in the first place. Where did he come from? 
bingo. So there is a certain element that we could have taken care of a long time ago. But if we wait just long enough, somebody else will either take it or it'll run out. And that's what happened. And, and that's fine. I'm, I'm fine with that. And I'm, I'm, I'm fine with, you know, not overburdening staff because we don't have room. We don't have people. We don't have time. But I think we need to just actually say, this is what's going to happen. But I think if we send another letter to McGuire and Woods, they're not going to be happy because they know what's going on. They're fighting for us. But I believe they're fighting. They both, I've talked to them both. They're both doing this. But if we want to send them another letter and says, oh, by the way, we want you to fix our recycling. They're both going to look at it and go, oh, no, you guys want your recycling fixed? We didn't know that. I just, I just think the idea of writing a letter just to write a letter is ridiculous. And I think it will, I think it will play against our hand rather than for a hand. They won't be excited to see it. I, I'm betting dollars to donuts. Maybe I'm wrong. So I want to note that when the um, application uh, was announced, the pilot program last year, I know that Linda uh, took a look at it. I took a look at it. What they were looking at was uh, for proposals that would be addressing essentially this uh, big loss of uh, recycling centers created by Replanet. Um, my apologies if I'm glitching out. Um, and it wasn't designed to meet the conditions that we have today. So when we all looked at it, it was like, these are great. We're not, you know, looking at uh, dropping in reverse vending machines. We're not looking at running routes. HWMA does not run routes. That would be a great thing if uh, one of the franchise haulers was interested in that, but we don't run routes. So, you know, based on what um, the state was proposing for the five projects, it was really clear that it was more towards uh, these uh, more urban areas. So, um, when we learned about it, uh, we certainly have been working really hard on this. Can I say something up here in Crescent City? We're, certainly, go ahead, go ahead. We are successfully recycling. One of the great benefits is you're not. We've got, we had a lady come up this afternoon from Leggett Valley. We've had people come from Laytonville. Uh, Jill had mentioned before that we did look at Humboldt County and could we, operate successfully down there marginally. One of the biggest concerns we have is that the recycling uh, system as it is today won't exist a year or two from now because of what a mess it is in. What we would do uh, as for what Jeff has mentioned, if we could get the money uh, on, for the processing fee to include aluminum because two years ago when we started, we were getting 75 cents a pound now we're getting 33 cents a pound. So that's, we could use those processing fees that are currently going to Cal Recycle and not, not coming to anyone. We can do it, we're, we're, we work hard, we have a crew, we don't have, obviously not a union crew. Uh, Randy and I have both worked la the last couple of Saturdays because we've got so many clients coming up from Eureka. It's there, it's possible. Uh, one of the things we need to find down there is the location. Uh, the benefit we have here, we own the mill site and we're utilizing the mill site. I'll bet there's some empty mill sites in Humboldt County, uh, having grown up there when there were a lot of mills operating and they're not operating now. I think the market can solve it. We need help from McGuire. We need help from the governor. We need some processing fees uh, that needs to be predicated not on what was happening two years ago, but what's happening six months ago is what's going to be happening in the future. Uh, we'd be happy to go back, reduce the processing fees if we get our 75 cents or 85 cents for aluminum. So I don't, I think you're uh, wrong, Mr. Bone, to say, let's give up on it. The market can solve it, but we have to have some help from the government who's taking the money out of the market and not returning it to the consumer. And to quote Forrest Gump, and that's all I have to say. Yeah, no, good points. Thank you for your input. So I, other other I'm board members? Or, I, if that's okay. Um, I, I agree with this. All that's being said by Rex and Jill about this pilot program is I'm 100% on board with that. I What I want to wrap my question up, and when I respond to my constituents in the council, that the one gentleman said for each the things that we take back to the processor that we're reimbursed for those for that nickel we give the customer we're reimbursed by our, the processor 
in all of the CRV prices? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes. Okay, Frank. Thanks, Frank. Next person. So, uh, Chair, uh, Director Castellano has uh, a question or a comment. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, sorry, sorry uh, Sophia. <laughs> um, this will be quick. I'm just wondering if uh, either now or, or prior to other members' questions, I could see um, Director Duffy's uh, suggested action again, um, because if I'm recalling it correctly, it, it does seem like there was a proposal to, that you included an option, or, or there was the potential for us having some recycling available locally, while also, um, you know, making requests of our legislators. Yeah, um, see here. Let me try to get this up correct. It'll take me a minute. Here's... And if I could just add a, a couple comments with with uh, board member Bond sending letters just saying fix it. I agree with you. I don't think they typically work, and they just fall on deaf deaf ears. But I think with what <laughs> Uh, the people from Hambro are talking about and, and uh, uh, Ms. Duffy, a list of solutions. These are the things that you need to fix and this is how it'll help. I think providing the specifics um, is gonna help this time around. And I think there's quite a few people within the industry uh, that are gonna come up with a specific list of ways to change the, the bottle bill that will help communities like yours and organizations like Ambro. So I th think providing the specific list and uh, I can share that with, uh, with Chair Duffy, uh, what we're working on down here. And uh, I'd be happy to get with the, the Hambro people as well. Well, I, through the chair, I agree hundred percent. But what I'm saying is the beverage association does spends about probably three to $4 million a year or more in lobbying. I know the Spirits Association is in, is in the top five, and I'm pretty sure Humboldt and Del Norte County are somewhere out by the popcorn stand, giving free bags of popcorn. We don't have a very big lobbying group. So whatever we're going to put forward is going to be very minimal compared to what they're coming forward. So I'm, what I'm trying to say here, we can send our local guys and say, hey, you're not doing enough. You need to do this for us and piss them off, or we can talk to these other guys or have them talk to them and says what works for us on a statewide basis. Now, Hambro says they need some processing money for aluminum, I think is what I heard. I mean, I, I have no idea what that represents. I have no idea what that represents, but, but or, or how much, and I don't know if they'd want to put it out there. So what I'm, what I'm saying is, it, it, we, for some reason, we can't do it. They can't do it because they have a mill site. I, I, I can't believe that they can save that much money on mill site because there's properties available. Um, but w with that being said, all I'm saying, and, and it's rather stark, but I think we need to tell people we have nothing in the plans or the works for the next, we said six months at the last meeting, and I'm going to say another nine months right now, because even if you wanted to buy vending machines, I, I you know, the our stores have already got the letters and they're getting a series of three of them. They get one letter and then they get three letters and then I think they get 60 days after the third letter. Is that right? Something like that. And I'm reading one right here just as I talk, but, but I'm just saying, and you're right, they're gonna pay the 3000 bucks. They're not gonna to wanna to get into a can co-op. They're not gonna to wanna, to, you know, and I think you have to have a certain amount of volume stores. We don't have a lot of big stores. We have a few. So with that being said, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out where we go. I'm just saying the effort of all our councils and everybody else to put a letter together, they feel really good and we can all vote 100% on them. The letters won't do us any good. We, we should be dealing on a different level with somewhere because we, we have not got any closer in the last three months, six months or nine months, I feel. We, we took cans for three days, but we got overwhelmed. So that's, 
that's just, you know. Well, actually, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you. I did not say send the letter to McGuire and Woods. What I said was we need to send these letters to um, legislative for legislative release because you said there our are state representatives. our state representatives. And we have a number of state representatives throughout California who have taken up the mantle of recycling. And there are a number of them, of them in Southern California, as well as the Bay Area. And we need to find those people with whom this message is going to resonate. The reality is, is that we have worked really hard in terms of trying to develop some form of proposal that will work for our community. And I really want to thank uh, Homestand as well as Recology for their willingness to even consider coming back into the fold. They don't have to do this. And the reality is, is that a singular location here in Humboldt County operated by one person is going to have the same problem that we had when we tried reopening. If we could have a coordinated and concerted approach and the ability to simply uh, manage inbound uh, customers, we can find a way to make this work. We ultimately still need to figure out how to address the, um, uh, the underlying market conditions, which is part of what Jeff is bringing up here in terms of the disparities that exist within uh, the processing fees and uh, some of the other uh, potential incentives for uh, getting here. And I guarantee you that we all have a much better understanding of what's happening with the CRV uh, program than anybody did a year ago, and certainly even more mm -hmm. than ago so you know this has allowed all of us to get a, a you know our heads wrapped around it it's not going to have a fix uh within six months maybe even a year but we absolutely have to have a seat at the table in order to make sure that we're um you know adequately advocating for what's going to be in the best interest for rural california okay good discussion um Who's left? Sophia, do you have any comments? Uh, Sophia may have left. She's, maybe she came back. She said she had to leave and she apologized. I didn't know if it was oh. just a temporary thing. Uh, we have hit everybody except uh, Director Bone. I am sorry I did skip you in the roll call list uh, because you were offline at the time. Yeah, I shut down for some reason. Any, what do we? <laughs> What do we, I didn't even know what we were voting on. We were on a letter about uh, Jeff's presentation. This is still just public comment on item five. Oh, uh, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, so what is the board's um, preference here? Uh, sounds like there's. Uh... I have another question. Okay, go ahead, Leslie. I actually have two questions. Um, in terms of, uh, Director Duffy, your, um, legislative relief request, do you, do you have a sense of how long that might take, um, any, no, I don't know. But, yeah. I mean, it'll have to be introduced. There'd be, have to, there would have to be some form of legislation that would be, uh, introduced. Um, and then of course it would, you know, still be subject to you know either approval or veto by the governor um, sure. but absent um you know the pilot project i mean that's what we were seeing as being a potential you know band-aid or a bridge um and uh, you know absent that we don't really have a lot of uh options because the really the issue is if we could just have this appointments. I mean, this whole thing has been driven by we needed to be able to manage the incoming number of people and calorie cycle telling us, no, you can't do that. Um, and then everything else, you know, um, you know, we're trying to figure out how to make it economically viable as well. But yeah. I mean, and then yeah. my, thank you, thank you. And then my second question is in, and I don't know um, if this is the appropriate context for this, but uh, I noticed the, the folks at Hambro mentioned the, that it's possible up there because they have a free site. And I'm just curious if they had access to a site for free down here, if, if that would make it possible for them to create an operation in this area for now. I for, you know, I don't free. know. That would be a consideration for Hambro. We looked at it. Uh, a great model to look at, I think, because I'm a market guy, is to look at uh, what's happening in Reading. Uh, Bigfoot Recycling, 
pretty much handles all of the North Valley. Uh, they have one spot where they're doing their bailing and handling the product. They have uh, trucks running in and out of that. I could, that was my model that I imagined for Humboldt County that would work. It, it would, I'd like uh, Mr. Bowen to come up and take a look at our facility. I think he might uh, be able to add something to ours as well as what, what I think could work down in Humboldt County. You could do that in your free time, Rex. Oh, I'm familiar. With, I'm not familiar with the recycling. I'm familiar with the operation where it's at and stuff. But um, yeah, I, I, and that's fine. I, I, I think there's a way around it. But I, I, well, all I'm saying is before we write, and I, and I know that a recycling advocate assemblyman in LA would love a letter from us. And I'm sure that would probably get him off, push him over the edge. Because um, he's only got 25 million people in his county. And I know the 162 between Del Norte and us will push him over the edge. Um, I, I, I'm just saying, and then you can find out which ones they are. I'm just saying our state officials that we have now are bus Woods and McGuire. Have, I mean, you've had, you've had Woods at the facility, at the facility. McGuire has initiated two different meetings and Chris Nielsen, a couple more with Cal Recycle. So they are humping it. They're doing their job. I mean, I, I've been talking to them on a weekly basis, probably for two and a half months. They're as frustrated as everybody that we've got to this point. They really thought we had a shot at the pilot program. And with that, we didn't, I guess. So um, I'm just saying, yeah, I, 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 I'll, I'll come take a look at the site. I'll, I mean, I'm telling you, if, if we get something, we can do a pop-up down here for you and you guys come down here three days a week, I'll find you a site. And you come down one day a week, it'll be A through L, so it's not appointments. They can just get in the line. The appointments will be a pain in the ass. Are you 1010 or are you 1015? And then do it alphabetical if you guys want to. And I'll find you a location if we have to. We'll have to figure out covering and everything else. But there are some locations. Most of our mills are turning into cannabis operations. So um, they, they're recycling green plants. So, But there are locations. So, it's worth Yeah, well, it's, it seems like... We well, let's see, Leslie has a comment. And, and Chair, um, not to interrupt, uh, there is some public comment from Linda as well still. Oh, okay, okay. Well, let's go to Leslie, and then we'll go to Linda. I, I was actually just going to ask if we had public comment. <laughs> That's all. Yeah, right. okay. I have comments, but that can wait. Yeah, okay. So, Linda. Yeah, I was going to, yeah, hi, how's it going? I was going to echo something that uh, Jeff was talking about with, you know, curbside collection and, and the um, and CRV increasing in curbside collection. I just wanted to make sure that you guys were aware that any right now with the I, I think when he wrote his presentation, you know, he wasn't familiar with the contract that we have with the HWMA when we're setting the rate that we pass on to curbside recycling customers. And that's for all recycled materials. We include whatever we get from the state that might be a CRV benefit that comes through from the Samoa facility. So it's not completely lost in the case of Humboldt County. Our contract is, is different and was the first one of its kind in the state to adjust its fees. It's kind of reminiscent, you know, when we went into the recycling processing agreement, is reminiscent to the kind of conversations we were having when we were going through that proposal you know, and people understanding that. And one of the things that happens is then if, you know, you set up, you know, the buyback centers, what, and we do, we don't want to take anything that might be benefiting people from the curbside, you know, so if it does end up going into a curbside program, then we are benefiting people that are not only in Humboldt County at using curbside programs, but we're also benefiting those in Crescent City as well who want to participate because they do send their recycling processing down here as well. So I just wanted to point that out. And also it saves on um, greenhouse gases with not having as many people going into recycling centers, which is a different, a different topic. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Linda. So where are we here? Um, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm seeing in a nutshell two problems or issues. The, the short term is we've got people that have been collecting this stuff for 10 months 
And as we discovered when we opened up our CRV, uh, we couldn't handle the volume. So, you know, if we open up tomorrow or two months from now, I mean, we're going to have that, you know, initial kind of flash flood that we're going to have to figure out some way to deal with. And, and certainly the, you know, the appointment seemed to be our, our uh, <clears throat> best shot at doing that and then at a certain point that that flash flood will subside and we'll be back to normal uh which would be a, a different ball game so i'm not sure i mean logistically you know you could get really big to deal with the flood and, and then once it's over you're back to you know downsizing to just operate on a normal basis um and I hear, you know, what Rex says, you know, I mean, legislative reform is, you know, a couple of years away. Mm -hmm. and, and if we wait two more years, that demand, that flash flood is just going to inundate certainly uh, our facility, if not others as well. Um, so... I don't have any immediate solutions to this short-term uh, high demand kind of situation. I mean, we've talked a lot about it. We've had some ideas. We we tried reopening and, and just that, that just didn't work. So uh, as others have said, I'm, I'm disappointed about the pilot project because that was an attempt in many ways to deal with that as well. So I guess I would be putting it back to the, the board and what they would prefer to do. Um, Jill kind of presented the, this letter for legislative relief. Uh, Rex has spoken to that. Do other board members have anything to say about whether it's worth putting the effort into another letter to not just uh, McGuire and Wood, but it sounds like, you know, other legislature, legislators that, you know, have taken this on themselves and are, are part of a coalition for reform and just make sure that, you know, they hear our voice along with the beverage manufacturers and the haulers and the big boys with the big bucks. Leslie, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um... I mean, I, I don't think this is necessarily, you know, an either or situation. Um, I mean, I think it makes plenty of sense to continue to have ongoing relationships with our local legislators, you know, as well as foster relationships with other people, you know, who are more active in this field. But I mean, and I imagine that we have, you know, we all have different relationships with them, but um, I mean, to me, of course, I think it makes a lot of sense to go forward with continuing to work for legislative change, you know, including like appreciation for, you know, Representative Wood and Senator McGuire and, you know, along, I'm sure they would be curious to hear an update, you know, where things are at, you know, and why we're continuing to move forward with this request. I, I don't think that, I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense personally. I don't, and I, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, people contact me about things multiple times all the time, and that's just my job, you know? I, I don't get real upset about it. Um, and then in terms of, uh, you know, simultaneously, I think that we can, I don't know. I mean, I would definitely be curious to have a conversation with the folks at Hambro, to, you know, to see if we can make something work out. Um, you know, I, you know I, I think we, should also continue to look and see what other options might arise during this time. Um, this is just a random question. I don't think it's possible, but we can't like add an extra tax on the plastic water bottles, can we? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. The laughter is all the response. <laughs> Well, uh, honestly, Leslie, I mean, it, that's, that's kind of what, um, not, not the tax itself, but, um, 
you know, there, there was legislation that was, you know, they lost by four votes. And part of it was getting at this whole issue of, of being able to address and reform, you know, plastics. And uh, that was in September and, and that was defeated. So um, you're not far beyond that. And I think that speaks to, you know, the need for extended producer right responsibility, or excuse me, extended producer responsibilities, uh, as well as a whole host of things. Personally, I think that if they're selling beverages, they shouldn't be in plastic containers anymore because we can't reuse them, you know, but that gets into a whole other thing. But I mean, I would love to just keep them out of our county personally, but you know, I don't know if we're quite there yet, but that that's a direction I'd be interested in going towards. So, uh, and I don't know, I think that's, I kind of shared all my thoughts. I feel like the staff have enough in terms of that for me. I mean, I know other members have things to say too. You know, I, I do. Um, I put forward the, the legislative relief because underneath Cal Recycle's existing um, regulatory structure, our hands are tied um, and just simply because any one of us uh, trying to reopen is going to be confronted with just a lot of people coming in. The, um, the, the regulatory structure is that you cannot tell people, no, you can't come. You cannot tell people your license plate is ending on an odd or even number. You cannot come in. It says that it's available and open. Uh, for anybody who wants to come in. And um, I've had conversations with uh, Bear River now. I've had uh, discussions with uh, representatives from Hoopa Valley Tribe and a number of other folks. And they're all like, well, maybe we can just do our people only. And it's like, that's not the way the state CRV program is set up. It's everybody. Um, so, you know, again, the reason I wanted to um, illustrate um, the facilities at Redway and Humboldt Sanitation is that they are caught actually even more so than we are. We have a little bit more room in which we have a queue lane, but they don't have that either. And so, you know, trying to figure out what that sweet spot is. So the, the pilot project uh, proposal as we were developing it, we felt like we could get there. The real sticking point for us was if there's a pilot project being limited to 25 pounds, people will freak, especially with, you know, the, the backlog of, of volume, which is why I really wanted to make sure that I read that correct and they said you did um, and yes you'll have to abide by that so clearly even if we had um, a, a slot and we could have been awarded we still would have this issue around a lot of material and people having to make appointments for a long period of time before they could get rid of that backlog okay. you know so finding something that maybe has um, temporary uh, legislative relief to enable us to open and manage. Um, the only way that's going to happen, according to Cal Recycle, is if there is um, regulatory or, excuse me, legislative uh, action that is taken. That is the only way in which they will amend any of their uh, rules. So I don't know um, another path, you know, forward. Um, and I will tell you that I've spent, you know, months uh, to the tune of um, there are a number of other, you know, projects that are, are currently being neglected because we just so, simply don't have the time. So if you guys have ideas, we certainly, you know, we'll continue looking for things, but it really is a legislative relief that we need. Yeah, well, it seems like classic tail wagging the dog. Mm -hmm. You know, um, like we've spoken before, I mean, this is really Cal Recycles. <clears throat> problem and we get stuck trying to no, make it's our it problem work. they have the fix yeah yeah it's not their problem they're not getting phone calls from people every day well they are but not from our people oh they're getting them they tell it they tell me that we have really mean people up here <laughs> <laughs> well that's true well anyway i mean if you guys want to write a letter go ahead i just i I don't support it. So if you're going to do it, so Rex, it. Rex, if we don't write a letter, are, are you saying we just put out a public service announcement saying we, we in Humboldt County are not going to provide any CRV redemption services? And that's the reality. And sorry about that, but that's the way it is in the tell, foreseeable tell future. There's a tell there's a legislative fix. 
Yeah. And I mean, we could write letters to our legislators or the recycling friendly re legislators and say, hey, we need this, but that's not going to drive the bus, Michael. I mean, we're, 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 we're pissing in the wind. That's not going yeah. to gonna change their outlook at all. Mm -hmm. We need a legislative fix. We need to explain it to people. And that's all it takes. We can, we can go back to our boards and ask them to write letters and our staff can write letters um, because God knows they don't write enough letters and don't have enough shit to do. But I'm just saying, our, our electeds are already getting enough letters. And I, unless they're completely out of touch, I mean, I, I mean, I talked to Rebecca from McGuire's office. I talked to Chris, talked to Paul from Woods' office, and talked to Woods and talked to McGuire. If they don't know we've got an issue up here, because I guarantee you in the last three and a half months, I have not talked to them about one other issue up here but CRV because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to put that in the forefront. So if they don't think it's an issue and maybe they just don't like my ass and they're not doing it because they don't like me, maybe everybody else should call them. Maybe we should write a letter. But what I'm saying is they're fully aware there's an issue up here. And until they get their counterparts who are, who control the house and the assembly and get some of that $1.7 billion out of cow recycle and get it doing what it's supposed to do and taking I guarantee you that silly law about appointments, they would not close us down if we broke it, but I'm just, you, we can hang our hat on it and everything else. That's why pilot programs are made is to change those silly little things because that does not have to change, but you can change the parameters. You can't change the, the spirit of the law. So what I'm saying is, I think everybody personally should get on the horn and start calling them if you want. They're fully aware. If you guys all want to write letters, that's great. Letters not going to do any good. I just, I made two texts to guys asking if I can have five acres of their land three days a week for a few months for Hambro or however long they want, because there are a couple pieces of industrial property around that aren't being used till somebody starts doing cannabis on them. So. Okay. So you're actually going to pursue that. Michael, give me another option that we've heard about tonight that will actually get us to the promised land other than writing another letter. Yeah, no, I'm I'm hearing you. That's why I'm asking you: Are are, are you as a supervisor going to pursue that, or do you think we as the waste management got, authority got should 70, be? Got seventy got seventy three acres in your backyard that aren't being used right now because of COVID. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just telling you, we got seventy three acres at the Humboldt County Fairgrounds. Yeah, yeah. Thirty five thousand of it under roof. Yeah, yeah. 32,000 of it under that can be actually be driven through and be covered. So, I mean, that's that's just one option that came to me. I'm not saying it's going there, please. But, but I'm, <laughs> no, I'm just I, saying, I without a traffic impact, actually, too, except for on Van Ness there. So, I mean, mm -hmm. there's, there is if we want to do this. But, I mean, we're not going to get a pilot program. So, we're going to have yeah. to help somebody do this. I mean, I mean, I mean, Frank can go down there and talk to the guys until they get it uh, brought out. Maybe we can use part of the, the old Eel River sawmill. I mean, I don't know. Maybe we can go one week there, one week. Other. I don't know. We'll have to talk to him. I don't know what they can do and how, how mobile they can be. But I, we're going to have to do some and be honest to the people that we're not going to do it. We're going to try to find them an option. And until and I think people are going to if, if, if we're going to put the whole basis on this with the governor signing something, I'd. We're not going to have to get a whole bunch of warm and fuzzies from our people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, not to mention that it's going to take forever. There's one uh, point, Jeff, 1.6, 1.7 billion dollars sitting out there, and we're looking at a 42 billion dollar deficit. He's not going to be spending money on cans. He's going to be spending money on other things, services. Mm -hmm. So, Jill, what yes. what is your take? Having listened to this discussion, do you think it would be worth? I know you have talked to Hambro, and it was my understanding that they did pencil out the finances, and it didn't really pencil out too well. Right. We 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 actually had um, uh, some discussions earlier this summer um, around that, so they did come down, take a look, a look at a couple of sites that we had talked about, including the Redwood Acres uh, general area. You know, basically, um, given the investment that would be required in order to set up, um, you know, a, a 
a location that was um, still uh, on here. not going to quite pencil out at, at that time. And I'm not going to speak, you know, for them, but, you know, we did, um, you know, reach out and, and have that conversation uh, around the possibility, um, you know, that was part of our conversation um, that Linda, myself, and Tasha had uh, with uh, McGuire's staff back in uh, early June, as well as with Cal Recycle staff around, can we open up a pop-up under our existing certification? And the answer was, it has to, each site has to be certified. So we would be looking at, you know, a multi-month process in order to get, um, you know, a pop-up site just so we could handle um, the mobile uh, collection uh, component. So that's why, you know, ultimately we were being encouraged. I've had ongoing conversations with Cal Recycle. It sounds like Rex has had ongoing conversations with Cal Recycle. And we found out on Tuesday morning that the presentation that I had for you, as well as the staff report of, of something that we feel the three of us uh, representing these recycling uh, entities, we felt like this could work. Um, that, that the rug has been pulled out, you know, from underneath our feet. So the only thing that I can offer back is we're not able to open underneath the existing um, rules and regulations. So what we need is some form of legislative relief so that we can, if we're not eligible for a pilot project, can some legislation be introduced on behalf of the rural communities that would allow us some of the flexibility that we need to provide the service to the community. Mm -hmm. Whether that comes from individual phone calls or emails from, from folks, that's fine. Um, but having a letter go out underneath the umbrella of HWMA, as well as uh, being echoed by the cities, I think it does help. I think it does. Um, mm. Well, I know that other letter we sent did go to like the, what was it? The Rural Counties Association. RCRC, yep. RCRC yeah. and we're on top of it also. We got 37 you, counties going through the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, is that group a, a lobbying organization or have a lobbying capacity in terms of pushing for we, we, we legislation? Have a, we have somebody that does just waste management. We have somebody that does lumber, timber. Yeah, we are. It uh -huh, is. Uh -huh. Are they advocating these points, Rex? Yes, yes. Have, the you ones that we have them? brought forward? I'm sorry? They are talking to people in the assembly. They're, that, well, the problem is with COVID, you're not, you can't walk over to the house as much, you know. Yeah, right. yeah, you know the doors are locked. Right, yeah, right. they are. There, there is constant conference because we're we got thirty seven counties going through the same thing. The other thing is, I do not think we're going to be able to do this on a rural basis. I think if we try to do it on a rural basis, I guarantee you, the suburban and urban communities are going to want to jump in on this. If the rurals are going to get a little bit, they're going to say, "Hey, we're subsidizing," which they will be. <clears throat> so 37, 37 rural counties in RCRC account for 54% of the land mass, 9% of the population. So if we were to initiate an appointment system in the short term to deal with the backlog, Rex, you said earlier, it might piss off Cal Recycle, but you didn't think they would fine us or well, shut we're not, us we're, down. We're not even, we've got to remember, you guys, I didn't, you guys voted to re decertify. Right, right. And now we're going to have to retrain. And I don't, how much retraining can there be if we were certified yesterday? Like being a yeah. doctor in, in California and being a doctor in Nevada, you have to take sure, a test. Sure, so there would, be that, the there would be that step. But it seems like. What Jill keeps saying is the, the regulations have tied our hands to get out from under this. So I'm thinking, well, if we just go ahead and do it, even though it may not comply with regulations, what are they going to do? Are they going to find us? They're not going to pay us the nickel. So your general counsel does not advise that yeah. this agency willfully um, violate regulations. Um, okay. I, I truly don't think you should even entertain that at the board level. Sorry, mm -hmm. I, I, I see board member Castellano appreciating the irony of this. Mm -hmm. but, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, was, that wasn't my idea. Yes, it was. <laughs> no, all right. I... 
from, from my, my perspective, uh, it took us two months to get certified here in Crescent City. Why wouldn't you sort of apply for a certification for two or three locations in Humboldt County, Fortuna, Eureka, Arcata, for McKinleyville, and then have, uh, again, back to the Reading model where they do all their bailing in, uh, they're at the Bigfoot Recycling Center. So I could foresee either Hambro or someone uh, down there that wanted to get into an enterprise opening, filing to open these three uh, convenience zone or whatever it's termed, uh, go ahead and get applications for those sites within a three or four month period, you'd be have that application. You'd need to make arrangements with, I don't know how many bailers are in Humboldt County. I know I'm quite confident there's the one at the Eureka plant. Uh, is there one at Samoa? I don't know if McKinleyville has one or Fortuna, but any one of those facilities could be rented uh, by the recycler to go in and process that. So I don't see it as an overwhelming obstacle if you want to do it. But somebody has to take some risk or there might be, have to be some uh, financial assistance for someone like us to entice us to come down and get involved in this endeavor. But it's not out of the question. I think to give up, that's, that's the only way to find peace is to surrender. Okay, well, we don't seem to be getting, uh, in using Jill's term, we're not finding the sweet spot here. Let's, um, let's, let's write some letters. <clears throat> That's what I got out of it. Yeah, well, I mean, I know last month or the month before, we, we talked about, you know, putting an effort into looking at longer term options and I'm assuming staff will continue to do that. You know, it's just that those options might have been reduced or, or the path become more narrow because of the regulatory structure of Cal Recycle, as Jill put it, really makes it difficult, if not impossible, for us to, to function. So uh, I don't have a problem with being honest with uh, Humboldt County citizens and telling them, sorry, um, you know, take your CRVs to to Del Norte or Crescent City or Ukiah or any place that Reading that has figured this out or has enough volume that, that it works for them. But in the, the short term, we're just not able to do it. And yeah, that's that's the truth. Those are the facts. And I don't have any problem being honest with people in that regard. Any other comments from the board? Yes, Leslie. Um, I, maybe I'll just reiterate what, what I said earlier in terms of, um, I mean, I'm, I, I feel like it does make sense to continue to, you know, present what we think will work in the long run long term to legislators and you know including relief um but also I, I do think it's worth um having this conversation with hambro or you know looking at some other alternative i don't know maybe i'm curious rex is if this is something you want to do at the county level um or you know, like should we converse um I, don't, I mean, I don't know. I guess I'm wondering if it makes sense to do it within like the HWMA board level or if it makes sense for, yeah, I, like how would how would we best go forward with that? You mean a letter? No, I think she's talking about, you know, working at something out with Hambro or, or a similar organization. Is that what uh, you mean, yeah. Leslie? Yeah. All right. I mean... Yeah, I can I can deal with our public works and stuff like that, and then they can talk with your people. I'm I'm I'm, what, you know, I've got the JP. So basically, the JPA of HWMA was not when it was set up. I, I talked to the guy that wrote it, and it was not set up for recycling. We 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 revamped a lot of stuff and added a lot of stuff, so it's not under our preview to do recycling. Uh, we do a lot of stuff that wasn't in it um, originally, but and now that the going's got tough we got to find somebody else to do it because there's no money in it so because i mean bottom line is the money used to be good and it's not good so nobody wants to do it mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. we're still out there 
we're still taking the money. Um, I.e., Hambro says that, that that it's successful for them. Um, I so I, I I guess I mean I think there's other ways we can look at it. I think we could probably put it out there. I'm going to make some phone calls to some other people in the morning, um, and, and I'm see if we can get some emergency CRV funds. I mean we've got to do something to get this thing going. We are uncertified now, and since it's which I again, so we'll take. Two, like you said, Mike, do we do we recertify now and take two months to recertify a couple of locations in case we hit a sweet spot? I don't know. I this is this is so screwed up. I can't tell. I don't know why we decertified in the first place. But with that being said, we're in this position. So, so Rex, and, I want to remind you, Rex, that our certification expired in May, and we so have I'm, been working with Calorie Cycle trying to have them do remote trainings. And so they finally have that and they're going to be putting that in place in December. Okay, great. So we'll recertify then. So how many places got decertified? Were, were, the, were, the, were the only one out of all the, I'm, I, anyway, that's fine. That's, but I'm just saying, so do we certify other locations? I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, Michael. I mean, I, I keep hearing nothing's going to work. So unless they give us a bunch of money. We're not asking for a bunch of money. We're asking for appointments. We're asking if we could increase the allowable daily limits so that that way we can get rid of the backlog and then we can reduce the overall demand. We are asking that we get handling fees, which by rights we should have been uh, receiving, but because of some old archaic uh, approaches, we should have been getting those uh, those handling fees. Um, Recology and um, HWMA didn't receive it. I know that um, uh, HomeSan was able to receive it for a short period of time. We're not asking for a lot. Uh, in the course of trying to develop an innovative um, uh, proposal like the um, grant criteria asked for, we look to um, have the recycling centers being able to handle the larger volume material and then have those uh, reverse vending machines to accept the smaller uh, volumes, let's say less than 50 containers. So when you go to the grocery store, you can redeem it. And that, um, you know, we, we had talked about um, conceptually how uh, those uh, units would be serviced because you're going to have to have somebody come in there at least three, four times a day in which to empty out um, the containers and get those. So it's it's no different than setting up a pilot, or not a pilot project, but a, um, uh, an off-site collection. It's still going to require people. It's going to still require equipment. And you're still going to have to get the material back to a point where you can uh, bail it so that you can get it into market. So, I mean, all these things can be done. It's all going to cost money to some degree. And so we were trying to figure out how we do that utilizing the existing infrastructure. Our ask was not big. Cal Recycle told us no. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, maybe the letter should just go to Cal Recycle and say, call us up when you've, you know, gotten your uh, legislative framework uh, so amended. Me my message will stay the same. Be mean, call Cal Recycle. We're not going to take it in the foreseeable future. We're going into the holidays. I mean, we better tell people. <laughs> People are still hanging on to this stuff, thinking they're going to get their 80 bucks or 60 bucks or 40 bucks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They can go to Crescent City. Thank God. Hambro likes to work late. They've got, they're going to put a night shift on. It looks like there's three guys there waiting to recycle right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know, cra crazy enough, um, I think that there was um, a little silver lining for, for Hambro in particular. Um, with their not being approved for the pilot project, they are going to be able to accept the up to 100 pounds. If they had been approved as a pilot project, that whole area, you'd only be able to bring 25 pounds max for a per material uh, maximum. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that would have uh, rendered it just uh, not feasible at all for even humble residents to go up there. Mm -hmm. I, I do want to just say quickly, um, I mean, I feel like Maybe we're approaching the point of moving on from this topic, um, but I, I do really appreciate um, Director Duffy, like all of the work you've put into this. And it's been really great having Jeff here and Hambro here and the other guests we've had. Um, I've definitely learned a lot more about the context, you know, both in breadth and depth. So thank you for that. 
Yeah, I agree. Okay, so do we need like Jill? Are you looking for like a an action item with a, a vote that gives you a specific direction or? Oh, it was it was simply a letter to to have the uh, board authorize you, the chair, uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. prepare and send out a letter. And of course, I'll help you write that letter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So does the maybe maybe we should vote on that then? Um, you're the, you're the chair. Yeah. You can just send a letter. It doesn't have to be voted on. I mean, Linda. Oh, okay. Okay. I mean, I, there's there's cons I mean. Well, I would letter. actually, re I respectfully disagree. Um, if he was sending a letter as an individual, he could totally do that. But if he's sending a chair, if he's sending a letter as the chair of the board, then he needs to be blessed by the board to send off a letter speaking on your behalf. Okay. Okay, well, let's see. Is there a motion to um, send a letter to selected uh, legislators? I have a comment. Um, okay, go ahead. I mean, a lot of what Rex says resonates with me for sure as far as like sending a letter and what good is that going to do. Um, however, I do understand that what we're searching for is more long term legislative legislative relief. Um, and so my request would be that any letters that are sent have concrete actions so that we're actually providing solutions and we're not just complaining about the same problem, which as everyone knows, and our legislative representatives included, like they know the problem. So I would just request that we're being very specific in any letter that we compose as far as what we think the solutions are. How are these formulas need to be changed? How could the pilot project be changed in terms of uh, maybe more than five projects um, or actually allowing bag drop or changing the formulas so that um, the reverse vending machines are viable? Some kind of some concrete ideas um, would need to be included in a letter for me to support it. Um, and then, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, no, I would agree. I think we need to stop complaining and start telling them what we need to solve this problem. Uh, so was there a motion to move forward on, on a letter from, I guess, myself with Jill's help? And we would be sending this not just to McGuire and Woods, but to other select legislators who are working on this issue? Is there a motion from anybody? I'll, I'll make that motion, Michael. Okay, we've got a motion. Is there a second? Um, I'll, I'll second it. Are we, is this the only action that we're gonna take on this item? We're sending a letter, is that is that the only thing? Or are we? I think in the, in, in the short term for this evening's purpose, yes, that's the letter in general requesting legislative relief, but I, I hear what you were saying in terms of being solution oriented, you know, uh, problem solving oriented, not just complaining. Okay, and, and what about Hambro's suggestion about, you know, simultaneously trying to recertify sites? I understand they're not economically viable until some of these changes happen at a larger level. Um, is there any direction we can take to pursue any further options, any just guidance that would help through HWMA and the board to do something like at the same time that we're trying to go for larger scale change or what are what are the thoughts on that? It will be the responsibility of the recycler to get the certification. So if Hambro is wanting okay. to do this, it'll be their responsibility to secure the, um, the certification. Okay, so you, you provided a second, Elaine? Is that correct? Sure, I'll second writing letters okay. all day so long. So we have a motion in a second. Tyler, are you still with us? I go, down, go down the roll call, please. Boom. Oh. Sorry, let me get my list back. Castellano. Aye. Hogan. Aye. Uh, Pereira is absent. Wilson. No. Sweeney. Aye. So that was three to two. Three to two with one absent. Yeah, okay. So the motion carries. 
Um, this has certainly been a, a, a good discussion, uh, overwhelming as it may be, complex as it may be, but I um, appreciate all your time and especially our our guests and their input on this discussion. Um, let's move on to the next item for this evening's agenda, which is board member reports. And we go down the roll call list again, Tyler, please. Boom. Yeah, I've been re getting lots of phone calls about, oh, we already talked about that. I'm, I'm done, go ahead. Castellano. <laughs> I'm I'm good for tonight. <laughs> Hogan. Nothing to report. <clears throat> uh, Wilson. Nothing to report. Sweeney. Um, no, I have nothing to report either. Uh, so next item on our agenda is the executive director's report. So we're back to Jill. So. If you all thought that CRV was fun, wait till you hear the next item. Treated wood waste. Earlier this week, HWMA received notice uh, that starting January 1st, uh, treated wood waste must be handled as hazardous waste. And this is a result of a bill that was vetoed by Governor Newsom in September. However, following the veto, um, there were continued efforts to enable the extension of this legislation and um, that uh, those discussions in the legislation have, uh, to allow that material uh, to be disposed of as incidental waste has now failed. Um, so uh, transfer stations effective um, January 1st are no longer going to be allowed to accept treated wood waste. So um, the hour is late and I do want to note that treated wood waste includes anything like pressure treated wood, creosote wood, as well as um, copper sulfide uh, containing materials. Um, we will go ahead and get some of this information out to you all, uh, but this is going to be a pretty big deal uh, in, in terms of how this affects people, as well as the cost uh, that will be driven up to dispose of this material. Uh, we're taking a look at uh, what some sorts of options may be, um, you know, but again, I, th I think one of the things that just I can't begin to underscore in light of uh, some of the big challenges that we've had this year, several of which that uh, y'all have not uh, been aware of, just because we've been trying, uh, literally trying to um, manage things are the best that we can, is that our materials management system is really vulnerable and it doesn't take much to upset things. And um, so we'll be getting this information, you know, out to you and um, it's not going to affect just HWMA, but it's also going to be affecting Humboldt Sanitation as well as Recology and all of our transfer stations and to be, you know, statewide. So there's uh, our contractors and our local businesses. There's going to be some real challenges coming to all of us effective January 1st. So with that, I will conclude other than we've just put in a lot of time and energy trying to uh, keep a lot of these efforts going forward. So it's always been my understanding in terms of green waste that painted wood or pressure treated wood does not belong in a green waste bin. So is this like more of a solid waste issue rather than a green waste compost issue that you should not be putting pressure treated wood in your garbage can or construction construction debris shows up and half of it's sheetrock and half of it's pressure treated two by fours. And we used to be able to just put that on the tipping floor and haul it off. And now we can't do that. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So does that mean we just reject it? Well, that's and, part of what we're going to have to be looking at. Uh -huh, uh, uh -huh. yeah. I mean, we're, we've, we've got a lot, but I also recognize, you know, the hour is late, but I need this on your radar because we're not meeting again until January and there's going to be some things that are going to be uh, you know, going into effect then. And uh -huh. it, it's too bad that the legislation was vetoed. Um, uh, and I think everybody's going to be scrambling now trying to figure out uh, how this affects them. Because it's not just Humboldt County again, this is going to be something which is statewide. Mm 
Uh -huh. And you know, we don't have sufficient uh, disposal locations for this type of material. And certainly the uh, collection and the transportation of this uh, material is going to be have to be handled as hazardous waste. Yeah, yeah. That's far so is a lot of the fire debris, you know, when, when homes are burnt and that debris is collected and hauled off, I remember I think it was Dry Creek was talking about that a couple of months ago. I mean, is that considered toxic or hazardous? Um, they have to go through and uh, DTSC and Cal Recycle has developed uh, screening mechanisms to determine whether or not material will be allowable for certain types of landfills and then the landfills themselves. Uh, depending whether they're in California or Oregon, they may also have criterion which they have to meet for the disposal of that material. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's getting more and more attention, obviously, as we are having these uh, larger and larger um, uh, fire events that are, you know, essentially wiping out communities. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's it's. Um, this is specific to treated wood waste, not necessarily. Yes, yes, I hear, waste, yeah. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah, got it. Okay. Um, it looks like we have another closed session scheduled. Is that correct? Item eight. We do. Um, so I guess that means everybody except the board and legal counsel needs to leave or do you just put them in the waiting room, Tyler? I would ask anybody that is not a board member, legal counsel, or the executive director to leave. Um, I am going to be making Jill the host uh, and locking the meeting. Uh, Jill, you'll be able to unlock the meeting if anybody leaves um, and needs to rejoin. Um, but you'll just have to use under the security preferences, you'll have to unlock it and then lock it again. People will still go into the waiting room, so you have some uh, freedom there, but um, that that is it for me, friends. Okay. I am no longer in charge. Have a great evening. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank, you. Thank you, Tyler.